Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to the 2020 Virtual International Head and Neck Cancer Conference. This year it's hosted by Ian Nixon, consultant head and neck and thyroid surgeon NHS Lothian. Welcome to session three. Here we're going to focus on the importance and impact of research in the fight against head and neck cancer. Does this mirror make me look fat? Hooray! <laughs> Coming up in this first session, we'll be hearing from Dr. Joe Brett and Mary Wells. What's happening in head and neck cancer survivorship research? Gillian Knight, working with the next generation of researchers. Elaine Emerson, saliva gland project, putting the spit back in the mouth. Professor Tim Aitman, liquid biopsy for diagnosis and management of head and neck cancer. At the end of each session, there'll be a question and answer section. Questions and comments too are on Twitter at hashtag, and these are all capitals, HNCC O N F 2020 and do follow us on Twitter too. So that's what's coming up. Now don't forget to download your copy of the Delegate ebook. First we have Joe and Mary who are going to talk about the upcoming Pet Neck 2 study. Professor Mary Wells is the lead nurse for research at Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust and a Professor of Practice in Cancer Nursing at Imperial College. Dr Joe Brett is a Senior Research Fellow in the Supportive Cancer Care Group at Oxford Brookes University. Hello, my name's Mary Wells and I'm a cancer nurse and I currently work at Imperial College and Imperial College Healthcare Trust in London. I've been working in the head and neck cancer field for some time and particularly in survivorship. And over the next 15 minutes or so, I would like to talk to you about what's happening in survivorship research in head and neck cancer. And after I've told you a little bit about why it's important and what's currently going on, I am going to hand over to my colleague, Joe Brett from Oxford Brooks to tell you about the PetNet2 study, which is a study that we're both involved in, that we really hope is going to inform and improve survivorship care in head and neck cancer into the future. And I'd like to say thank you to the Swallows for inviting me today. And I just wish that we could all be together instead of on screen. This quote from Arthur Frank from his fantastic book At the Will of the Body, I think is probably more relevant for head and neck cancer than perhaps any other type of cancer. In that head and neck cancer leaves no aspect of life untouched. It not only affects people's ability to swallow and to drink, sometimes their ability even to breathe, their ability to talk, on the phone or even communicate normally in person, their way of looking at themselves, their appearance is often affected. Their ability to kiss loved ones and to sit down for a simple family meal and enjoy the company of loved ones and to eat comfortably without a problem. There's now been quite a lot of research that has been done to explore the experience of patients with head and neck cancer, uh, particularly after treatment is over. And uh, some colleagues and I uh, did a review, a systematic review of the qualitative studies. Those are the studies um, whereby patients are interviewed about their experience. Um, and we brought all these studies together and looked at what were the most common uh, themes that uh, we could see across all the different studies. 
and uh, they're here on this slide um, that patients talked a lot about the uncertainty of uh, living with having had a diagnosis of cancer and having completed treatment, um, waiting for appointments, waiting for scans, kind of waiting for something to change, uh, that fear of recurrence uh, that many patients experience. They also talked a lot about the disruption to daily life through symptoms like swallowing difficulties, um, dry mouth, uh, fatigue, problems that uh, created difficulties in everyday aspects of life. And they also talked about having had experienced changes in how they felt about themselves, um, who they were, um, their sense of themselves, if you like. And this is something that John Diamond talks about in his book, uh, see because cowards get cancer too, which some of you may have read. And if you haven't, I recommend it. It's funny and dark and compassionate uh, about John Diamond's experience of having head and neck cancer. And as some of you will know, he was a journalist um, who was married to the chef Nigella Lawson, and he became ill in his early 40s. And he wrote this book about his experience and he talks about this loss of self and and says when i tell you that i'm not myself at the moment i don't mean merely that i'm in a state of discomfort but that i'm really not me i'm somebody else precisely i'm a little old man who i imagine to be called albert or norman or george so he kind of actually started to feel like somebody else he was looking at himself and he was different um and I think it captures that loss of self quite well. And apart from the qualitative literature, there is also an increasing body of evidence on the quality of life of patients with head and neck cancer, which is mostly amassed from questionnaires uh, looking at different aspects of quality of life uh, at different time points. And this is just one conceptualization of quality of life depicted here. Um, and this is the World Health Organization's domains uh, where the WHO splits quality of life into six different domains. And I think uh, most people in the audience would uh, identify with the fact that head and neck cancer can affect all of these domains um, from the way somebody is physically, the symptoms that they experience, their emotional well-being, their ability to be independent, their ability to be social, um, to enjoy social and sexual relations, uh, their uh, environment around them, including finances and access to health and social care, for example, and also their spiritual, religious and personal beliefs. We also know more about the unmet needs of patients and carers uh, with head and neck cancer. There have been two studies done now in the last few years. Um, one of them was one of mine and the other one by Giuliani et al was done in the US. And both of these studies found that around two thirds of survivors of um, head and neck cancer had at least one unmet need. And the studies used different assessment tools to look at the unmet needs of patients. Uh, so the results are a little bit different because of the nature of the problems and unmet needs that were being asked about. Uh, but the American study found that the most common unmet needs were uh, a need for more coordinated care, for accessible parking and for life and holiday insurance. In the UK study, which was done in Scotland, uh, patients' most common unmet needs were around fears of recurrence of the cancer coming back and around oral problems and eating problems, so dry mouth, swallowing, uh, that kind of thing, and fatigue. When we looked at the predictors of unmet need, and what that means is the factors that were most likely to be associated with uh, 
greater unmet need. Um, both studies found that younger patients and people who had poorer quality of life or more distress were more likely to have greater unmet needs. The American study found that uh, patients who were closer to the end of treatment also had more unmet needs. And in the UK study, I found that people who were unemployed, who lived alone and who had ever had a feeding tube were more likely to have greater unmet needs. Giuliani et al um, did a study of carers unmet needs as well and also worryingly found that two thirds of carers had unmet needs of some, uh, some sort. And their most prominent concerns were around a recurrence, fears of the cancer coming back, uh, also on accessible parking and on coping strategies in relation to the impact of being a caregiver. Um, and a, a, an Irish study found that carers' uh, most common unmet needs were around fears of cancer coming back, reducing stress in the life of the person who was living with head and neck cancer, and also looking after their own health. So much of this research has informed the current guidelines on survivorship care. And here I've shown you three different guidelines. There is one that's specifically about head and neck cancer survivorship uh, from the American Cancer Society, uh, an Australian guideline and UK uh, multidisciplinary guideline, which is actually about the whole cancer pathway from diagnosis onwards, not just on the survivorship. But there are some common themes within these guidelines. And um, the first issue that they particularly talk about are the recommendations for surveillance. So that is uh, the uh, follow up care and uh, consultations with a specialist and scans and that kind of thing. They also talk about the need for physical and psychosocial uh, assessment. Um, so looking at the side effects and screening for um, any particular problems that perhaps are red flags to things getting worse. They also cover health promotion, so aspects like smoking cessation, which is obviously very important, and keeping active and having a good healthy diet. And the other aspect that they cover is uh, survivorship care planning. So how can we as clinicians work with patients and carers to produce a plan of care that is going to meet their needs um, as they, um, after they complete treatment and to try and resume uh, a, as good a quality of life as possible? Over the past few years, there has been quite a lot of debate about whether we are doing the right thing in terms of our surveillance and follow up of patients with head and neck cancer. Because there's an increasing amount of evidence now that routine follow up doesn't necessarily pick up more cancer recurrences than patients themselves would pick up because actually patients know their own bodies and are more likely to notice when something is wrong. And that obviously what we don't want to be doing is bringing patients up to the hospital unnecessarily. Um, and we also are aware that our current follow-up systems don't necessarily meet the needs of patients who have got a number of complex, difficult problems that they're living with. And that we perhaps need to be better at balancing the need to monitor how somebody is doing from the point of view of their cancer and also meet their survivorship needs. And this debate uh, is definitely being influenced by COVID. Um, it's impossible to do this talk without recognising the impact that COVID has had on survivorship. Uh, it has definitely highlighted and caused concern amongst clinicians that patients may be even more socially isolated, that uh, 
they are already a group who have high levels of anxiety and depression and unfortunately higher suicide, suicide rates. And there is concern that COVID may have exacerbated uh, some of the psychological difficulties that people are living with, um, that it is having an adverse impact on working lives um, and also, of course, has affected uh, people's access to treatment and care. Um, and as many of you, I'm sure, will have experienced, uh, many consultations have got have become online consultations or telephone consultations. Um, but of course, this has also made clinicians realise that it is possible to have some good quality consultations using technology and using different uh, modes of communication and that actually perhaps it's okay to do some of these things that we have maybe been a little shy of changing before. So as this paper says, um, it may be time for a paradigm shift in how we monitor and uh, care for patients particularly after treatment has finished. So against that context, I wanted to now talk a little bit about some of the research that has been happening uh, recently and uh, research that is currently going on. So one of the biggest studies uh, that has uh, been happening in the last few years is the University of Bristol's Head and Neck 5000 study. And this study has recruited over 5000 patients with head and neck cancer over a number of years and has followed them um, uh, from diagnosis to uh, long into survivorship, three to five years into survivorship. And it has looked at uh, the biology of cancer and uh, included tissue and blood samples and saliva samples and it has also looked at quality of life and many other aspects of how uh, patients respond to head and neck cancer and how their lives are after head and neck cancer treatment. So this uh, study has also given us a huge database from which we can answer further questions and one of the studies that I'm involved with at the moment is looking at what the outcomes are of older people with head and neck cancer. Aside from Head and Neck 5000, there are also several studies that are looking at trying to reduce toxicity or improve recovery. And many of these studies come under the umbrella of the NCRI, the National Cancer Research Institute, which has a head and neck cancer focus group, which looks at what studies are going on at the moment and whether uh, there are enough research uh, trials and other types of studies happening to answer the important research questions of the day. And the Head and Neck Cancer Group has a subgroup which is specifically focused on survivorship and epidemiology research. And I sit on that group as a nurse uh, alongside a speech and language therapist, uh, a patient and several other different clinicians and researchers. So I just wanted to mention a few of the studies that are particularly looking at survivorship areas. Uh, the first two are studies that are aimed at reducing longer term toxicity. So the DARS study, uh, which was reported, uh, its results were reported uh, earlier this year at ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology. And uh, these results were very promising. What this study did was it uh, used IMRT, intensity modulated radiotherapy, which is the modern way of giving radiotherapy, and it targeted the IMRT so that the swallowing organs were uh, protected as much as possible from the higher doses of radiotherapy. And what this resulted in was that patients in the uh, dysphagia optimized IMRT uh, had significantly better 
swallowing outcomes compared with people having standard treatment. Another study that um, is looking at a similar kind of way of reducing the intensity of treatment so that the normal tissues are less severely affected is the PATHOS study. And this study is particularly aimed at patients with oropharyngeal cancer who have HPV uh, positive cancer. And what it is doing is uh, giving patients who are less at risk of recurrence, uh, less intensive treatment. So patients are starting with minimally invasive surgery um, and then going on to have their chemo radiotherapy depending on the risk that that particular individual has for recurrence. Um, so this is, um, if you like, personalising their treatment uh, more effectively. And there are also studies going on that are aimed at improving recovery. And this particular study here, the GRAND F study, is looking at how we can improve function after neck dissection. Uh, those people in the audience who've had a neck dissection will know that the shoulder and neck function can be significantly affected uh, in terms of pain and weakness and mobility. So this study is looking at how we can improve those symptoms by using uh, physiotherapy and exercises to uh, reduce problems in the longer term. There is also quite a lot of work going on in the area of improving assessment and communication. And some particular work I'd like to mention is Simon Rogers' work. Uh, Simon is a maxillofacial surgeon uh, in Liverpool and he uh, devised a clinical tool called the Patient Concerns Inventory, which asks 57 questions. It's a very quick tool. Um, and those 57 questions cover areas that we know from research and clinical work are likely to affect uh, patients with head and neck cancer. And this tool is used either in clinic or on an iPad or can be used remotely to help patients to identify those concerns that they wish to talk to the doctor about or the nurse or speech therapist or dietitian or whoever it is they're seeing. Um, so it helps to highlight the most pertinent things for that particular patient. And uh, Simon is just completing a randomised trial looking at the impact of the PCI. Um, and I think we're all very excited about the outcomes of that work. So there are a number of areas of research uh, going on around the world at the moment. And I would say that they probably, in survivorship care, focus on four main areas. The first is outcome measures. Uh, so these are the questionnaires and the tools that we use to measure uh, change and uh, different types of outcomes that are important to patients and to clinicians. Um, and many of these are now called patient reported outcomes. They are uh, quality of life questionnaires or other questionnaires which patients themselves um, can report and tell us about what is most important to them. So uh, there are a number of studies looking at which outcome measures are the most meaningful for clinical practice and research. There are also studies going on to look at information, education and support for survivorship and particularly the role of technology, which I think has really um, come to the fore during COVID. There are studies looking at how we can improve uh, survivorship through more person-centred approaches to care, particular interventions or nurse-led packages of care that will provide a more holistic approach uh, to survivorship. And there is also the very important area of care and needs and what we can do to both understand, assess and uh, meet uh, the very difficult uh, experiences and improve uh, the experiences of carers. 
So this brings me on to my last slide, um, which is really just to introduce the PetNet2 study. So the PetNet2 study is set against the context that I hope I've described over the last 15 minutes or so. Um, and what this study will do is to develop and then evaluate a new approach to follow up and survivorship that is based on uh, a PET CT, a CT scan done at one year post treatment um, to check that there is no disease and no recurrence of cancer. And then patients will be randomized either to what is standard follow up now or to a new model of follow up, which is based on their symptoms and needs and is also initiated by patients. So it will be something that is much more uh, orientated to patients' needs themselves. And in this study, we are looking at quality of life, at fear of recurrence, and at patient experience. And I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Jo, to tell you more about the study and how you might be able to help us with it. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference. Hi, my name's Jo Brett. I'm a Senior Research Fellow at Oxford Brookes University. I'm also a co-applicant on the PetNEC2 study, which I'm going to give you a brief introduction to. Now, the PetNEC2 study um, is comparing patient-initiated follow-up with the current clinical follow-up um, in head and neck cancer patients who are identified as low risk of recurrence um, after a PET CT scan at one year after diagnosis. The study is being ran by Uni the University of Birmingham. Um, it's been led by Paul Nankavel and Hisham Mahana, and uh, it's funded by the National Institute for Health Research. Currently, people finishing head and neck cancer treatment attend a clinic review every two to six months, which is normally up to about five years. Um, some patients feel that this is too frequent and it actually increases their worry about cancer recurrence, particularly just before going to those appointments. Um, and some patients uh, delay actually reporting the new symptoms of recurrence and they often wait until their next appointment to report them instead of just contacting the clinical team when they identify them. Um, and there's also increasing numbers of head and neck cancers, which is input, putting immense pressure on the existing services. So there is a need to find a more effective and efficient way of following up patients. Now, studies show that a new type of scan called a PET-CT scan, done one year after treatment, can identify patients who are unlikely to get recurrence and could therefore be followed up less frequently or could go on a pet, to a patient-initiated follow-up. So the PetNet2 study um, aims to compare the effectiveness of patient-initiated follow-up with the current standard of care routine regular clinical follow-up in patients identified as low risk of recurrence following a PET-CT scan at one year. It's a randomised controlled trial um, to assess which method of follow-up is most effective and efficient. It's a five-year study. We're just starting phase one, um, and phase one aims to develop an information and support package for patients who will be following the patient-initiated follow-up. And this is to help them identify symptoms, know who to call if, if they identify the symptoms, and also to help them overcome barriers to follow-up. So we're looking for patients and carers to get involved in this first part of the study to help us develop the information and support package. Um, so you can get involved in different ways. We've got some small discussion groups, which we're running through Zoom um, to help us inform the content and format of this information support package. Uh, there's questionnaires that you can complete um, to help, help us identify the patient barriers to um, this new way of following up. And there's telephone discussions too about the acceptability of patient-initiated follow-up and again about the patient barriers to patient-initiated follow-up. Um, we're looking for patients who were diagnosed in the last three years and their carers. So we're hoping to, to have the discussion groups from the end of November this year through till March um, 2021. 
the questionnaire and the interviews may be a little bit earlier than this. Um, so if you're interested in getting involved in any way, please do get in touch with us with your contact details and tell us how you would like to get involved. You can get involved in all three, the discussion groups, the questionnaire and the telephone discussions, or if you prefer one or the other or two of them, then just let us know. So thank you for listening to our talk. Um, here are our contact details. Please do get in touch with us um, or get in touch with Chris if you're interested in taking part in the study um, and let us know how you want to take part and we will send um, more detailed information on to you. Um, also, if you've got any feedback in general about the talk, please um, pass that on to us as well. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening to us. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> My wife said, if I buy one more guitar, she's going to leave me. God, I'm going to miss her. Actually, probably not. Hurrah. Hi, I'm Scott Benton. I'm a Member of Parliament for Blackpool South. I'm delighted to extend a warm welcome to everybody who's listening at home to this fifth International Head and Neck Conference 2020. Chris Curtis does a brilliant job here in Blackpool working with a charity to support those patients and carers. As COVID continues, the implications for that on people's health care across the UK are obviously significant and I continue to work with ministers to make sure that people's cancer treatment is delivered in the usual way, which is so important. But I hope everybody has a great conference. Please do continue the brilliant work you do across the whole world in supporting those people who need it. My name is Lisa and I'm a registered dietitian at a university cancer center in Colorado. I've been working with head and neck cancer patients for close to a decade. And I believe that the registered dietitian and patient collaboration is crucial during treatment. The dietitian can help educate and advocate for the patient so that they make it through treatment um, and optimize their nutrition throughout the entirety of treatment as well as post-treatment. Um, the registered dietitian can provide tips and tricks, especially regarding nutrition, but also other uh, medications and therapies to lessen symptoms related to treatment. Good luck with the conference. I hope you enjoy the two days. Sorry we won't have our display stand, but please go to allrelief.co.uk for information, leaflets and any samples you need. Hiya to everybody there at the Swallows Conference from me, Emma at BioExtra. We hope you have a fantastic couple of days there. We've attended in the past, unfortunately it's all virtual this year. We've thoroughly enjoyed it and we hope you take a lot from the next two days. My message to you from BioExtra, keep lubricated and keep well. Take care, bye bye for now. Hi, I'm Linda Tomarelli. I'm a speech and language therapist and I work for SpeakNeek. We create personalised synthetic voices for use on communication aids. My role is to support people to go through the voice banking process and to work with healthcare professionals to enable them to help their patients use our voice banking technology. I use my background as a speech and language therapist to help repair voices where the patient may have slowness or slurring and to design voices for people who have no natural speech. This means our personalised voices are accessible to everyone. Speak Unique create personalised synthetic voices for use in communication aids. This allows people to communicate in a voice that is identifiably their own through text-to-speech technology. I'm Ewan McDonald. I'm from Edinburgh. I'm Ewan McDonald. I'm from Edinburgh. It's so hard to lose speech, so anything that reduces that sense of gloss helps. In these modern times, medical technology has come a jolly long way. Here you are, sir. Enjoy your leeches. Today's leaders in technology really know their onions with the wonders of modern science.
robotic surgery knows no bounds. I say, you young scallywags, stop playing with the equipment. Indeed, it can breathe new life into patients. Now look at that marvelous, healthy glow. Isn't the NHS wonderful? Where would we be without it? 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 Yes, of course, the NHS really is wonderful. And today more than ever, it's embracing modern technology for the benefit of all our lives. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the field of robotic technology. Cancer patients across the world are living proof that investment in state-of-the-art robotic surgery is working. Science is working and we must continue translating science into better cancer patient care. Hi, it's Mike Heffernan from Dr. Hef's Remarkable Mints here. Uh, I hope you're enjoying another conference, albeit in a virtual world. Uh, I also thought it would be a good idea just to let you know that we're now working closely with Swallows Charity and you can buy uh, Dr. Hef's Remarkable Mints in our new packaging uh, from our website and you'll get a 5% discount if you enter in the discount code SWALLOWS2020 and the benefit is that Swallows also get a 5% uh, revenue uh, into the charity to continue doing all the great work that they do uh, for both carers and patients alike. I uh, wish you all the very best for the rest of 2020. Bye for now. Hello, my name is Sam and I work for Flen Health. Flamagel RT is for the management and prevention of radiotherapy induced skin reactions. It does this by creating the optimum healing conditions to accelerate cell renewal. It provides a protective barrier against external contaminations and provides a cooling effect that reduces pain on the patient's skin. In clinical studies, 7% of patients experience moist decoration when using Flamagel RT compared to 35% of patients using Dexpanthenol. This is why we're pleased to say that 94% of patients said that Flamagel RT met or exceeded their expectation. Mouth Cancer Action Month takes place every November. We work closely with the Oral Health Foundation and all head and neck cancer charities to promote the event when dental practices across the country try to raise awareness of all head and neck cancers. To find out more, or to join our annual 10K Awareness Walk, please visit our website www.mouthcancerfoundation.org Welcome to your New Look Conference, coming to you from the edge of space. Next we have Gillian, who's going to talk about working with the next generation of researchers. Dr Gillian Knight has been working in higher education for the past 10 years and is now Associate Dean for Learning and Teaching at Aston University. Hi, I'm Dr Jill Knight and I work at Aston University and today I'm going to give you a talk around the research that I've been doing for the last couple of years to get a better understanding of how our year 8, 12 to 13 year old kids understand around the HPV, human papilloma virus vaccination, and also their knowledge and understanding of the diseases that HPV can cause. So first of all, just a little quick introduction to the human papilloma virus or HPV. It is an exceptionally common virus. Uh, around 80% of people will be infected with HPV by the time they get to their mid twenties. It produces warts in people and it can produce warts on the outside of your skin, such as verrucas or warts on your hands. But it also can produce warts and be infectious on your mucosal cells. And your mucosal cells are the cells that line your mouth. They line your um, gastrointestinal tract, so your digestive tract, and also will line your genitals. And these are known as your mucosal cells. There are over 100 different strains of HPV and around 30 of those will infect just these mucosal cells. 
Now, in most cases, when people get infected with HPV, it's a fairly benign infection. They may have some warts or verrucas. It might last 18 months to two years. And after that, the immune system recognises it has a viral infection and then clears the virus naturally by an immune response. Some people may even not express any um, obvious warts, but they can still actually be infectious and spread the virus to other people. And this is known as asymptomatic. But what we do know is that certain strains, and these are known as high risk strains, can go on to cause cancer. And it generally happens in people that have been infected with the virus for a long time, maybe 10 years or so. And it seems to be the presence of these high risk strains of HPV in a person for a long period of time may increase their risk of developing cancers. Now, HPV, initially, when people started looking into human papilloma virus, we thought, yeah, it caused warts on your hands, on your feet, and also genital warts. However, in the last kind of 20 years or so, probably more in the last 10, as we've become better as scientists to detect these levels of HPV, low levels of the human papilloma virus, we've started to find out that actually the virus infects really quite a wide range of different parts of our body. So obviously I've already talked about the fact that it can infect those mucosal cells on the genitals. But we now know as well that it infects the mucosal cells in the mouth. Probably not surprising being it's in the mouth and we swallow it. It's also been found in the esophagus. And certainly there is increasing evidence that maybe the presence of a long term HP infection in the esophagus may play a role in development of esophageal cancers. With a precursor to esophageal cancer known as Barrett's. it's not surprisingly because HPV is found in the mouth it actually is also found at the back of your throat and that's known as your nasal pharynx region which is where your mouth and your nose meet together at the back of your throat so again we know that HPV can reside there the fact that obviously we can breathe in HPV means we've also been able to find detections of the virus in the lungs again this is at fairly low levels but there's a potential around HPV infection and lung cancer but once again, this is quite this is something that's being investigated in more detail. And finally, we also know that HPV can be found in the large bowel, whether this is because it has been swallowed and survived the stomach or whether it's migrated up from the mucosal infection of the genital region. We're not so sure. But again, we definitely are able to detect HPV present in the large bowel in your large intestine. So when we think about HPV transmission, if you talk to people around genital warts, they're immediately going to say, oh, it's a sexually transmitted infection. Well, HP isn't really, because HPV is actually spread by close contact with infectious virions. And what's key to understand about HPV is it's really quite unique. It lives in our skin, as I've already said, and that's a really quite difficult place to be living in our skin. And when it infects us, it, we think it microabrasion, so little cuts in our skin, and it will affect these lower levels of our cells that are still alive, and it will set up home there. And then as these cells then go through their normal skin life cycle, what happens with the cells is only the bottom layers of your skin's actually alive. The top layer of your skin is dead. And that's probably not surprising because it's a protective barrier. We wouldn't want alive cells at that top layer because it'd be painful and be bleeding a lot. So those top layers of our cells are dead, and they just slough off naturally, as you know, dust around the house is a lot of that is dead skin cells. And the HPV, it knows this and it's evolved its own lifestyle to very much mimic how our skin cells work. So it will infect in those live cells at the bottom. And as those skin cells die, they move through the different layers of your skin. And by the time they reach the top layer of your skin, they're dead and will slough off. So the HPV cycle has been designed to tie around that it will initially infect those living cells. And as those cells slowly die and migrate through the skin layers, the HPV goes through different stages. To be the case, when it gets to the very top layers of your skin, it's now a nicely packaged infectious virion that can be spread to other people. 
And again, this picture here of the skin cells, this is what a, a, a well-established Veruca looks like, with each of those skin cells being infected by lots and lots of virus and are shedding the infection, the, the infectious virions. So obviously, if you come in contact with that, you're likely to pick up a HPV infection. So it's very easily spread and it's spread by close contact with infectious virus particles. And there's my little picture of my HPV there sitting on the top layers of my skin, ready to be sloughed off and to affect a new person. So when we talk about HPV, it has, I think, an element of being linked with sexual activity because it simply lives in the genital region. It infects those mucosal cells. And in most cases, when you come in close contact with somebody else's genitals, it's more often not via some kind of sexual activity. But it's not spread by sexual activity in the same way other sexually transmitted infections are. It's not spread by bodily fluids, it's spread by close contact with an infected area of the skin. Now we do now know that genital HPV infections can spread from the mouth, again by close contact with an infected individual, but there's now increasing evidence that if somebody has an infection in the mouth, they may also be able to spread that to other people. And as I said before, in most cases, this really isn't an issue. It may be that you may get infected with some warts for a year, maybe 18 months, or you may not have any symptoms whatsoever of the virus and you naturally clear the infection without even knowing that you were infectious. It's just for those limited individuals where they don't seem to be able to naturally clear the infection that they will then go on to develop cancers from them. Now, interestingly, well, something we've worked out probably in the last, again, 10 years or so, is there is actually quite a gender divide. And this means that it appears that be more men than women actually harbour a HPV infection. So if you look then at penal prevalence versus vaginal prevalence, you can see it's nearly double in men. When you look at then the overall prevalence of HPV in the mouth, it's still much lower than where it is in the genitals. And we think that probably reflects it's a more difficult environment for the virus to live in the mouth than it is on the genital mucosal cells. But once again, when you look at that difference between males and females, you'll see that more men than women seem to harbour a HPV infection. And this can be a little bit impacted by their lifestyle choices, with homosexual men more likely to have an oral HPV infection than homosexual women. Or again, maybe around their ethnicity. And we know with Hispanic and black men and women are seen to be more prone to having HPV infections than other ethnicities. The reasons behind this is still really being explored in more detail. But when, but obviously because this fact that men seem to have this high prevalence, it's certainly been something that's been looked into in more detail recently. And what we do know is that not only do men have a higher prevalence of having HPV, they're also six times more likely to be infected with HPV-16, which is one of these higher risk strains, ones that we know that can go on and cause cancer if there's been a long term infection. What we also found out is that actually men don't seem to mount an immune response to HPV in quite the same way as women do. So if nothing else comes out of this talk today, you can sit there, men, and go, man flu does exist. Men don't seem to be able to have such a high response to viral infections by circulating antibodies than women do. And this might mean that for a HPV infection, it takes longer for the body to understand that it has a HPV infection because we don't, they don't seem to have such a, a good antibody response and stroke or it may mean that it takes men longer to clear the infection again because they don't have that normal such a high antibody response as women do. This is still really being investigated in more detail but it's certainly starting to show that HPV prevalence in male is overall much higher than what we see within women. Now obviously the point of today's talk is a little bit around HPV and the role it plays in oropharyngeal cancers or cancers of the um, head and neck region, basically that back part of your throat where your mouth and your nose comes together, the oropharynx region. Oropharyngeal cancer has been increasing significantly in the last 20 years. And most of this occurs in our economically developed countries. So the US, the UK, Europe, for example. 
And we think this again may tie our little bit round to lifestyle choices, elements of how we live in our lives, maybe our diet, our sexual activity. There does seem to be a high prevalence of HPV related oropharyngeal cancers in these developed countries. More men than women are diagnosed with HPV positive oropharyngeal cancers. And as I've already said, around the like prevalent strain in the mouth of men being HPV 16, a significant proportion of these cancers are positive for HPV 16 as well. This strain we know also can cause cervical cancer, but it really does seem to dominate currently as the main strain that causes cancer in the mouth. How HPV is causing head and neck cancer is not really fully understood and there's a significant amount of work going on around understanding better how HPV lives in the mouth, how HPV is completing its life cycle in the mouth and this is another area of research that I do as well around HPV infects the tonsils which is the main site we know around HPV cancers to understand better how the virus is actually causing an infection. As I'm sure you've been aware there is a vaccination out there against HPV, which is fantastic. And we now in the UK have been vaccinating our girls since 2009 and we vaccinated them at the age of 12 to 13. And since 2019, we've now started to vaccinate our boys. We use Gardasil, which is the main um, predominant vaccination program within the UK. And it vaccinates against HPV 16 and 18, which is two high risk strains, but also six and 11 genital wall strains. So far, this has been a success case. We have shown that it has been very good at preventing oral HPV cases in both men and women in the US. But unfortunately, the uptake in men does appear to be quite a bit lower than in women at the same stage of the introduction. So at the moment, men do not seem to be so aware around the HPV vaccination and the importance of becoming vaccinated. And that really takes me on to the last half of my talk was, well, what work have I done about this? I knew that we were coming up to having vaccination being introduced to be gender neutral boys and girls. So I wanted to see before that happened, what do our 12 to 13 year olds actually understand about HPV and more importantly, the vaccine that they are given. So what we did then, we asked a number of Midlands based schools to take part and five of them agreed to take part in the study. We sent out participant information sheets to all the children in year eight, which is the year where they get given the vaccination for HPV, which is when they're 12 to 13 years old. And overall, we had a 52 response rate, which was excellent. And we had 357 participants, 12 to 13 year old kids willing to take part in the study. We then went into the schools, into one of their um, uh, health sessions and asked each of the kids to complete a questionnaire by themselves and we made sure that they were doing this without any help from their mates. The questionnaire we decided to make it multiple choice and closed questions so they had to select particular answers and we did this really for ease of questioning because they were 12 to 13 year olds but also importantly we had a time limit of getting it done within the class two session. We then, after we completed the questionnaire, did an interactive session with the class around HPV and HPV vaccination as an incentive and a thank you for the schools to allow us to come into their classrooms and undertake our research. So, as I said, we had 357 participants overall. 65% were females compared to 35% males, and that purely represented the response rate rather than the fact that these schools had a higher proportion of females. Overall, the ethnicity very much reflected what we see within the UK with the predominance of being a white and also in the other ones coming through a range of different mixed ethnicities. Over half of the um, children stated no religion when the other ones, 34.7% said they were Christian and again the rest made up a range of different religions. So we were pleased to find out that overall our cohort identity very much reflected the UK aspect and therefore could make this comparable to a UK study. So first of all, we asked the kids, well, what do you think HPV causes, which diseases? And we got them to select a number of different variables. Not surprisingly, both boys and girls knew that there was cervical cancer there with more girls than boys selecting cervical cancer as the main HPV disease. When you look at things like penile and anal cancers, the boys seem to be more aware of this than the females. However, when you go and start asking things like genital warts, neither 
of the two um, genders really knew that HPV causes genital warts, which is its most common thing that it actually does do, or in that case, skin warts and mouth warts. This was very little known about this. And again, when you start to look at things like mouth cancer, very few understood that HPV has a role in other cancers outside the genital region. And as I said before, their understanding of things like mouth warts were very low. Then when we asked them, well, what diseases do you think the vaccination prevents? It pretty much mirrored the same. Again, a lot of them knew, the girls particularly knew that HPV prevents cervical cancer, with about 60% of the boys knowing that it prevented cervical cancer as well. The girls certainly had much less awareness that maybe the vaccination could prevent other cancers as well, such as penile and anal cancer, which we know it can do. And again, because of that lack of understanding from both genders around that HPV lives in other parts of the body, there really was very little awareness that maybe it prevent things like mouth cancers or other skin cancers, which actually it doesn't have particularly good protection against. But also, again, they didn't realise it would actually prevent the main disease of genital warts and skin warts and mouth warts. They really not understanding the link between preventing a viral infection. In their eyes, it's preventing the cancer. And that is really reflective, I think, of how we've been educating both parents and children around the cervical cancer vaccination. That's how it first got portrayed rather than a vaccination that's against a virus that can cause cancers across a number of parts of the body. So this really started, I think, for us to ask when we did the analysis of this, well, is our HPV education a little bit too cervical cancer biased? And I think the answer is currently, yes, it is. When you again ask a little bit more and dive down a little bit more into these kids' understanding of HPV and the diseases it causes. Only half of the participants thought males could get HPV, and this was significantly lower in females, i.e. less females thought HPV was an infection both genders could get. They actually thought it was predominantly in women. And of course, this is really quite concerning when I've said before, there is that gender divide that more men than women harbour a HPV infection. Not surprisingly, most of them thought that it was spread, um, spread by sex. And very little of them know it's actually spread more by touch. And so what, when they then asked how they can prevent it, and we weren't talking about vaccination here, we were talking about as in, how, as in how you as a person can maybe prevent you picking up a HPV infection. They immediately think because they felt that it was a sexually transmitted infection, the best thing to use is a condom. Now, OK, a condom would help reduce the risk, but because HPV by close, intimate touch, there's a good chance that people have picked up HPV, maybe on their hands and spread it to different parts of their body or their genitals prior to a male putting on a condom and undertaking that penetrative side of sex. So again, it's that understanding of the kids that maybe there's other ways that HPV can be spread and they need to be aware of this. When we asked around the vaccination what it made them think about it, both of them felt that the HPV vaccination did remind them of the risk of tra sexually transmitted infections, which anything that makes kids think a little bit around their sexual health is good. But we went on and then asked and said, well, OK, so if you then feel like you've been vaccinated, how is that going to make you feel around about taking sexual risks? And it was interesting to see that more boys than girls felt that actually if they had been vaccinated against HPV, they might go on and take more sexual risks in future because they were less likely to pick up a very common infection that can be spread by sexual activity. And again, this indicated to us that maybe we need to be thinking around that wider remit of education of how do we actually tell boys and girls around the risk of HPV and get across that it's not just a cervical cancer biased infection. And this again carries on when we talk a little bit around we, we asked them for some open ended comments, as in what actually do you think it is? So we asked them again, both the boys and the girls, do you know what HPV is? 78% of the boys outright said, no, we don't. When actually about half the girls said, yeah, no, no, we do. More than half said, no, we do know what HPV is. But interestingly, when you look at the comments, that probably doesn't really reflect. You're seeing that boys are putting down in statements a little bit more true. It's a cancer that boys and girls can get. It's an infection in your private areas. It's a human virus. When the girls are focused a little bit more around 
prevention of cancer. HPV can prevent you having cancer. It's a jab which can prevent cancer. It's for cervical cancer, which girls can get, which is a little bit true, more true. So it does seem that actually the girls think that HPV vaccination is about preventing those cancers rather than necessarily stopping the viral infection per se. And the last thing we wanted to find out was, well, where do these kids actually access their HPV education? Are they doing any additional information research themselves? And what we found is very few, less than 15, 12% of our participants had done any extra research. They had basically been informed by their parents' decision to make sure they had their HPV vaccination. But when we did ask who they'd spoken to, not surprisingly, there was a, again, a bit of a difference in gender divide. The boys seem to be using more public health websites, Cancer Research UK, NHS, when the girls are talking to their parents and also reading that leaflet from school. But it was still a very low response rate. Only around 11% of the children, the girls that responded, actually bothered reading the leaflet the kids, the school gives to explain HPV infection. And then we then follow that up to say, well, how would you like to be educated about HPV? It really came across of both genders that they would like to be taught more by a healthcare professional that went through and explained to them their risks in a language they probably understood and also listened to, closely followed maybe by a lesson with their teacher. And certainly the boys were really not interested in reading a leaflet at all. And the girls were like, OK, the leaflets are OK. But again, it wasn't particularly high response rate. So we do seem to at the moment be perhaps educating our kids in a way that they're not particularly interested in. And more often, maybe we should actually be talking to their parents and making sure their parents are well educated to understand and inform the children. But also importantly, maybe we need to think about encouraging other healthcare professionals to be much more knowledgeable around the risks of HPV. This could include dentists, this could include pharmacists that are able then to have those conversation with 12 to 13 year olds in that kind of more informal setting around what the vaccination actually means to them, why it's important to them as a male and or as a female, and therefore also how they need to be thinking about how HPV will affect their overall lifestyle choices as they become older. So really, just now with a little bit of a summary, when we looked into what um, diseases that HPV, the adolescents thought HPV could cause, only half of adolescents um, were aware that disease can be both infecting male and females, and most women seem to think that it was a disease only women can get. Cervical cancer is still the main disease they associated with HPV, and very few adolescents knew about oral HPV infection. That's probably not that surprising because that's the same across the whole of the population, that very few people know that HPV can live in the mouth and has been linked with head and neck cancers. Only around 11% of the girls and 5% of the boys had bothered reading any information provided by the NHS around the HPV vaccination. And certainly what's come through here is that we felt that male adolescents needed more tailored HPV education to make them aware of their male related risks rather than perhaps a more generic information that talks around HPV risk across society. And we would say that maybe by having this information we would hopefully start to increase vaccination uptake, though it has been in the UK, but also understanding of what HPV means to males and so they can be better informed as they go through their lifestyles. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you very much for your time. This work was conducted by myself and a collaborator at the University of Derby, um, Dr Ben Roberts. The work was published recently in a British medical journal publication around sexual and reproductive health, and there is the reference there. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for your time and for listening today and thank you. Hi, it's Guy from CC Med. Just want to wish everyone at Swallows all the best of luck at their virtual head and neck cancer conference. Such a shame we can't be there this year, but let's hope to get some get together next year. We at CC Med obviously look after the ASLI Royal Farm Dry Mouth range. If you'd like to learn more about that, then please visit us on our website. In the meantime, best of luck. I'm sure, it's going to be a great couple of days. Really looking forward to it.
My name is Amber Thomas. I'm a registered dietitian and a board certified specialist in oncology nutrition. Before I started my own private practice, I worked in a cancer center for over 10 years and we primarily helped individuals through head and neck treatment. And I feel very strongly that working with a dietitian is very important for your success going through such a difficult treatment. The dietitian should be able to help you find foods that you can tolerate, foods that you can eat, which may include things you're not used to or changing uh, the texture or modifying the food in some way because of the side effects that you'll experience. Your dietitian should know the side effects for your particular treatment and be able to provide you guidance even ahead of time before those side effects actually happen so you're prepared and you're ready to stay nourished and stay strong. So working with a dietitian is absolutely so important to help you heal both during the process of treatment and after. Hello everyone, my name is Lewis from Flint Health. Many of us are suffering from skin reactions that often gives us no choice but to give up on the activities that we enjoy the most. We at Flint Health want to provide innovation that allows everybody to enjoy the life that they love. This year we are proud to be supporting this year's Swallows event and honoured to be involved with such an inspiring charity that work extremely hard to help patients and carers. At this year's event, we'll be hosting an educational breakout session, which gives you the opportunity to learn more about radiotherapy by one of the country's most respected radiographers. Also, a fantastic opportunity to discover a solution for your skin that at present may be very sore, itchy and red following on from radiotherapy treatment. It is extremely important that this year we bring clinicians, patients and supporting companies together as one to be supported and to support others. Hi, this is Joanna Knight from Capitex Healthcare. Uh, we're very proud to sponsor the virtual Head and Neck Conference 2020. Thank you. Ho ho, hee hee, ha ha. Rutherford Cancer Centres. We're here, right where you need us. Hello, my name's Daniel Hughes. I'm from Aspire Pharma and we really hope you're enjoying your conference today. We're here to talk to you today about oral mucositis and dry mouth, specifically Alpronite mucosamine. You can find out more information about mucosamine by visiting our virtual stand. We'd love to virtually see you and we hope you have a lovely virtual conference. Hello, my name is Abby Miller. I'm a speech and language therapist working at Chesterfield Royal Hospital in North Derbyshire. I recently won a fellowship from the National Institute of Health Research to help me learn how to carry out research in the health setting. And I'm studying a master's at the University of Nottingham. I would like to use these skills in order to benefit patients with head and neck cancer. We know that people with head and neck cancer return to work less often than people with other cancer types. I really want to understand what it's like to return to work following head and neck cancer, what was tricky or what helped you. So I'm keen to speak to anyone who has gone back to work to understand your experiences and I would do this by a one-off interview either on the telephone or virtually at a time to suit you. If you'd like to find out more information or take part in this study, that would be fantastic. You're very welcome to contact me on my email address. I also have a Twitter account 
um, where I recently wrote an article explaining what's happening in the research internationally around head and neck cancer and return to work. So please do contact me or of course you can leave your email address and contact details with Chris and he'll pass them on to me. Thank you. Hello, my name's Philip Lewis. I'm the president of the Mouth Cancer Foundation, the national charity which supports everyone affected by the disease. We work to improve awareness and provide education, both for the public and healthcare professionals. Early detection is the key. That's why we've developed our self-examination protocol. To find out more about us or to join our annual 10K awareness walk, please visit our website, www.mouthcancerfoundation.org. Hooray! Dry mouth affects one in four adults within the UK and can have a significant impact on your overall health. That's why we created Auraleave, a complete oral care range for dry and sensitive mouths. The enzyme system found in all Auraleave products helps supplement natural saliva to help keep your mouth healthy and comfortable. Designed with dry mouth sufferers in mind, our products are free from alcohol or foaming agents that can irritate a sensitive mouth. Headquartered in Luton, Bedfordshire, our small and super friendly team works to help raise the awareness of dry mouth with healthcare providers and patients alike. You can visit our website, drop us an email or give us a call from Monday to Friday, 9am to 5.30pm. We are ready to answer your questions about our range and process your orders. We love hearing from you. Oraleave, making dry mouths happy again. Hi, I'm Dr. Elaine Emerson, and I'm a research leader at the Centre for Regenerative Medicine, a research centre at the University of Edinburgh. Join me for a special behind the scenes virtual tour of our laboratories and to find out more about our research to develop new treatments for head and neck cancer patients recovering from radiotherapy. When Chris was diagnosed, he just switched off straight away. He didn't take anything on board, he didn't listen to anything. He just went into his own little zone. He, um, he decided he couldn't peg feed himself. He was just far too lazy to be bothered to do it. He just couldn't be arsed, basically. Um, he thought it would be so much better for me to feed him. Um, coming from a day's work, in my black work suit, have to feed him and then decides he's going to cough and this mixture flies all over me and he sits there laughing like a right, you know, clever sod that he is when poor me is dripping in all this food, I've got to clean it up, it's still on the ceiling because he can't be asked to clean it off or even decorate. Um, he went into his own little what I call cancer bubble where it was all about him he didn't care about me or the family. He just sat there like a right miserable little twat. Um, you know, to be honest, that's my nickname for him now, miserable twat. He's not got any better. You know, he puts a big smile on for everybody else, but he don't give a shit about the rest of us. <laughs> I went to a really tough medical school. We had to find our own cadavers and bring them in. Next we have Elaine, who's a leading researcher in Edinburgh, who's going to talk about her salivary gland project, aiming to put spit back in the mouth. Elaine Emerson graduated from the University of Liverpool in 2004 with a BSc Honours in Genetics. She undertook a PhD in Regenerative Medicine and Cell Biology at the University of Manchester, receiving her doctorate in 2010. Hello everyone, I'm Elaine Emerson and I'm a research fellow at the University of Edinburgh. And I'm delighted to have been invited to talk to you today about the work my research group is undertaking to manipulate the peripheral nerves of the niche to improve salivary gland regeneration. So just to give you a brief outline of my talk, 
I'll first introduce the clinical need for us to undertake such research, which really requires very little introduction to this audience. I'll then talk about how my research into salivary gland regeneration started when I was studying development. I'll then move on to what we've learned about adult salivary gland biology and regeneration from mouse studies, followed by a project that's currently ongoing in my lab, testing if we can pharmacologically return neuronal signaling to promote regeneration. So it really needs no introduction to this audience that the salivary glands are the organs responsible for producing saliva and they're absolutely essential for a healthy mouth. Saliva is crucial for the antimicrobial protection of the mouth and teeth, oral functions such as speech, sleeping and eating, and the very first stages of digestion. And one of the most common reasons for a loss of saliva production is damage to or destruction of the salivary glands, meaning they can no longer produce this essential liquid. So here you can see two pictures of someone suffering from xerostomia or chronic dry mouth, and this has a substantial impact on patient quality of life. We looked at clinical trials across Europe and the US, and while in the last 20 years, a considerable investment has been made into preclinical and clinical research for xerostomia, only 7% have reached the final phase of the process, phase four, indicating that the majority of strategies or products are not moving out from the research pipeline. So at present, there's no cure, and these patients most often rely on the constant use of synthetic saliva, oral rinses and lubricants, or even simply carrying a bottle of water with them at all times for the rest of their lives to keep the mouth hydrated. So humans and mice both have three major pairs of salivary glands that are located in and around the jaw, as you can see in the schematic on the left. And when we look at a cross-section slice through a salivary gland, you can see they have this branching structure. And this cartoon on the right shows that in simplistic terms, the salivary gland is composed of many thousands of secretory acina cells that produce saliva, connected by a huge network of ducts that then transport the saliva into the mouth. And all of this is surrounded by blood vessels, nerves, immune cells and stromal cells. So as I previously mentioned, one of the most common causes for a loss of salivation is damage to or destruction of the salivary glands. And this is exactly what happens in head and neck cancer patients undergoing therapeutic radiation as a curative treatment, where despite the process of delivery with IMRT, they still often inadvertently lie in the field of irradiation and get irradiated along with the tumor. So here you can see fluorescent microscope images of a cross section through a healthy salivary gland on the left and a gland from a patient who's had radiation therapy two years previously on the right. And following radiation, I hope you can see that there's a really obvious destruction of the gland and in particular of the saliva producing acina cells, which are shown here in green. So a potential regenerative approach, not only for salivary glands, but for organs as a whole, is through the use of stem or progenitor cells, either transplanting progenitors into injured tissue or reactivating resident cells to internally repair. However, a major block in our ability to further on investigate this possibility is that very little is known about progenitor cells and the mechanisms that regulate them in the salivary gland. So I approach this question by first aiming to understand how a progenitor cell builds an organ in the first place and the cues that control this, and then apply this knowledge to understand regeneration in the adult gland. So I predominantly use mouse models to understand the signals that control development. And the really nice thing about the mouse salivary gland is that we can culture them ex vivo or outside of the body and monitor their growth and development in real time, as you can see here in this movie. And what's really amazing is that even prior to a blood supply being established, everything that's required for growth at this stage is being made by signals from the surrounding environment or what we more commonly call the niche. So the idea of the niche controlling organ growth was something that really fascinated me. So I decided to focus my attention on an aspect of the niche that had been previously understudied, the peripheral nervous system. So when you see an image of a whole embryonic mouse salivary gland on the left, and a whole adult mouse salivary gland on the right, you can really appreciate that the nerves that are shown in green in both really envelop and supply the whole gland. And the role of peripheral nerves in controlling salivary gland function has actually been known for over 100 years, predominantly thanks to Pavlov and his experiments on salivating dogs, where he demonstrated what we now know as a classic conditioning response. 
So here he showed that dogs will salivate upon not only the presence of food, but also a stimulus that they associate with food, in this case, ringing a bell. However, what's relevant to my work is that he also showed that when the nerves supplying the salivary glands were surgically cut, the dogs no longer salivated either the food or the conditioned stimulus, demonstrating how important the nerves are for this seemingly very normal function. In addition, it's already well known that nerves positively affect other tissues and skeletal muscle, for example, atrophies in the absence of nerves. So studies such as these suggest that the nerves provide trophic cues that are required for tissue turnover. So the salivary glands develop through a process that's known as branching morphogenesis, which is common to many glandular organs, including the lung and the mammary gland. So we know that the gland first forms from a single bud and then undergoes extensive rounds of branching to form this tree-like structure over here on the right. And what I want to draw your attention to on this slide, in the schematic at the top and in the fluorescent microscope images at the bottom, is that the nerves develop in parallel with the salivary gland epithelium itself. So in these microscope images down at the bottom, you can see the gland epithelium in red and the nerve shown in green developing in tandem with each other. So given that these structures develop together, I thought there must be a reason for this and ask the question, what role do the nerves play during salivary gland development? So to initially investigate this, I utilised a genetically modified mouse model which lacks a gene that results in no nerves in the head and face. So here in the top panel, you can see the salivary glands branching off from the tongue in the control. In contrast, in the bottom panel, in the genetic mutant, the glands are much smaller and much less branched. To then confirm this in a non-genetic manner, I set up a simple ex vivo experiment where I took the different components of the gland apart and then put them back together either with or without the nerves and then cultured them in an incubator for 48 hours. What I found was in the absence of the nerves in the bottom panel, the glands were again significantly smaller and less branched than those with the nerves in the top panel. And crucially, the absence of nerves also resulted in the loss of a progenitor cell population marked by SOX2, which is shown on the right in green. So collectively, this showed that the nerves are essential for salivary gland development. So like most aspects of mouse versus human development, we know a lot less about the human salivary gland, but we do know that the processes of development are very similar between mouse and human which means that I can use our knowledge from mouse studies to help us to understand human salivary gland development. So throughout my research career, I've been really fortunate to have access to human fetal salivary gland from elective termination, which would otherwise be discarded. And I can use this resource to determine how closely human development resembles mouse development. So the use of mice in our research has allowed extensive characterization of the markers that mark specific cell types in the salivary gland via the use of genetically modified models where we can fluorescently label cells, for example. Here, using immunofluorescent staining, I was able to show that these same markers are almost exclusively conserved in human salivary gland, where we have markers such as SOX2 and SOX10 marking the saliva producing asini, as in mouse, and keratin 7, 14, 5 and 19 marking the saliva transporting ducts, again as in mouse. So then, in order to determine if the nerves also influence human gland development, I developed a nerve gland co-culture assay. However, because of the much bigger size of the salivary gland during human development, I couldn't just culture human salivary gland in the same way as I could for the mouse. So instead, I developed an assay where I took small pieces of human fetal gland and grew them with the isolated nerves from a mouse gland. And despite the fact that this assay involved using tissue from two different species, it worked really beautifully. And in this fluorescent image that you can see in the middle, you can see the mouse nerves shown in red wrapping around the human salivary gland in blue. In addition, what was really interesting was that, like my mouse studies, we found that SOX2 positive cells were reduced in the absence of the nerves in the bottom panel here, compared to the top panel where the SOX2 cells are labelled in green. So this suggests that the nerves are also essential for human salivary gland development. To then ascertain what the nerves were producing to have this effect, I performed some loss or gain of function experiments. 
So here I blocked different nerve signals using inhibitors or activated signals using activators. In the loss of function experiments, I found that even in the presence of the nerves shown here in red, blocking the neurotransmitter acetylcholine was sufficient to reduce SOX2 positive cells that you can see here in green. In addition, blocking this pathway also substantially reduced expression of a marker of function at Corporin 5 compared to the control, which you can see here in green. In the gain of function experiments, I found that an acetylcholine mimetic carbocol was sufficient to increase the number of SOX2 positive cells in addition to cell proliferation. So collectively, this suggests that acetylcholine signaling maintains salivary gland development by signaling to SOX2 positive cells. So next, I wanted to find out how important SOX2 was for salivary gland development. However, we were faced with the problem that SOX2 is a very important gene for lots of different things in the body, as you can see in this image here. So if we just delete it, the embryos don't survive. So we turn to an approach whereby we can delete SOX2 in just some organs by mating one mouse that carries the genetic modification for SOX2 deletion with one that carries the gene for a particular tissue, in this case keratin-14, which we know is expressed throughout the salivary glands at these very early stages of development. By administering a drug at a specific time, we can delete SOX2 in cells that express keratin-14 in a temporally regulated manner and the offspring will have SOX2 deleted in the salivary glands. So when we do this, you can see the drastic effect this has on development of the salivary glands when you compare the control image in the left with the image of a gland that's had SOX2 deleted on the right. In addition, markers that we associate with function and maturity of the saliva producing asana cells, SOX10 here in green and the water channel acroporin 5 here in red were lost when SOX2 is deleted. So collectively, this suggests that SOX2 is necessary for salivary gland development. So once I knew the cues and the signals that were at work during development, I then moved my focus to adult regeneration. So despite the fact that SOX2 positive progenitor cells are found throughout the salivary gland in the early stages of development, this expression becomes restricted just to the saliva producing asana cells in adulthood, which you can see here in this image, with the SOX2 positive cells here in green, we never find SOX2 cells in the ducts. To determine what cell types these adult SOX2 positive progenitor cells give rise to, I performed genetic lineage tracing experiments where we use a fluorescent marker to trace all cells that come from a particular cell type. So in this image on the right, I just want to draw your attention to green cells. So any cell that's arisen from a SOX2 positive cell will be green. And as you can see, SOX2 cells and their progeny contribute to saliva producing asana cells only. And again, you'll note that the ductal structure that's going diagonally across this image here is completely lineage negative, i.e. it's blue, not green. So I then wanted to determine the requirement of SOX2 in adult salivary gland maintenance and repair. So I undertook two experiments in tandem, first deleting the gene SOX2, as you can see here on the left, and second, killing SOX2 cells here on the right. And as you can see in both situations, in the right-hand panel in each, deleting SOX2 or SOX2 cells has a striking effect on the glands, and deletion severely depletes asana cells that are labelled here in red. Thus, from these studies, I concluded that SOX2 is required to maintain asana cells. So then in order to determine the involvement of the nerves in an adult salivary gland, I undertook an in vivo denervation experiment where I surgically cut the corda tympani, the nerve that supplies the salivary glands and the tongue, on one side of the mouse only, leaving the other side as a contralateral control. Seven days later, I see a substantial loss of the asana marker at Corporin 5, shown here in green a considerable reduction in the nerve surrounding the gland itself in the middle panels here in red, and a concurrent loss of SOX2 positive stem cells here in green. When I then perform a similar experiment in the lineage tracing model that I previously introduced, I find about a twofold reduction in green asana cells following nerve transection compared to the intact nerve in the image above demonstrating that not only SOX2 positive cells themselves, but also the extent of SOX2 of cell replacement by SOX2 cells is reduced following nerve transection. 
So again, in order to try and determine what the nerves are producing to have this effect, I undertook loss of function or gain of function studies. So firstly, I developed an ex vivo lineage tracing model where I studied cell replacement in small pieces of gland grown in an incubator and again, blocked different nerve signals using inhibitors or activated signals using activators. As you can see, after three days in culture, there were much larger SOX2 positive clones, so green clones, in the presence of the acetylcholine mimetic carbocol compared to the untreated control. And in meanwhile, the antagonist for DAMP was sufficient to reverse this, though there were less GFP positive cells. This implies that acetylcholine signaling can promote SOX2 mediated acinocell cell replacement in the adult salivary gland. Then to test if acetylcholine also stimulated SOX2 positive cells in vivo inside the body, I treated mice for a short period of just 16 hours with the muscarinic agonist pelocarpine, which I'm sure will be a familiar name to, to many of you. I then counted the number of SOX2 positive cells in the gland. And interestingly, pelocarpine had no effect on the overall number of SOX2 cells shown in the graph here on the left, but did significantly increase the number of dividing SOX2 cells marked by the proliferation marker KI67 shown in the graph on the right. So collectively, this suggests that acetylcholine signaling in the adult gland promotes SOX2 positive cell replacement and proliferation. So how does all of this relate back to human health? So as I already told you, the salivary glands are inadvertently damaged in head and neck cancer patients undergoing radiotherapy. But crucially, I also find these patients have lost the nerves that are surrounding the gland, shown in this panel in green. And I'll explain why we think this is happening at the end of my talk. In addition, via transcriptional analysis, I also find a reduction in SOX2, the nerve marker GFR alpha, and the receptor that acetylcholine signals through chrome one. So altogether, this suggests that following radiation therapy, patients lose the nerve surrounding the gland. This in turn means that no acetylcholine is produced to support the progenitor cells and the damaged gland can't regenerate. So one of the things my lab is now working on is to, is to develop a novel system to locally mimic neuronal signals in order to promote reactivation of resident SOX2 positive salivary stem cells and as such promote endogenous regeneration, which we hope will then ultimately lead to salivary gland regeneration in radiotherapy patients. So if you cast your mind back to a couple of slides previously, I showed that the acetylcholine mimetic carbocol was able to increase the amount of SOX2 mediated acinocell cell replacement, i.e. the number of green cells that you see here in this left hand panel, and that the drug pelocarpine, which is currently prescribed to patients to stimulate residual salivary tissue, also increased SOX2 positive cell proliferation. So from this, it appears that a good approach could be to give patients a similar drug to promote cell replacement after radiation injury. However, the reason that pelocarpine isn't widely used as one might have thought is that the receptors that it signals through are expressed throughout the body and taking this drug can lead to a number of off-target side effects such as racing heart, diarrhea and excessive sweating. However, using this data as a proof of principle, we're now testing a panel of newer drugs for their ability to do the same. So, so far, in order to address this, my fantastic postdoc, Cecilia, has performed a search of commercially available agonists or drugs, and then narrowed this down to 10 drugs for testing, based on certain criteria, including their appropriateness for in vivo studies, safety testing data, and their chemical structure, the reason for which I'll explain later. In addition, she's developed a reproducible method to assess these drugs, where she cuts thin slices of the mouse glands, a technique that's used quite regularly in brain research, which she then floats in a dish and grows in an incubator. So the really nice thing about these slices is that they're much more consistent than the explants I previously used, and the whole slice can be imaged using a microscope, which you can see here in these images down at the bottom. So Chechi then cultures these slices with different drugs to assess how good they are at driving SOX2 mediated cell replacement, which to remind you is shown here as the number of green cells. But following on from this, she needed a quicker way of counting how many green cells she saw with each different drug. 
So she started using a computer program developed by a scientist in Germany called Johannes Stiegmeier, which is able to detect individual cells from a microscope image. Once she has this data, she then uses another program developed by Guillaume Blin, a researcher based in our centre, called Pick Cells, which can count the number of green versus red cells, which is shown in this pseudo-coloured video and in the graph on the right here. So Chechi is now using this method to test a panel of different drugs of interest for their effectiveness in promoting SOX2 positive um, cell replacement. And from this, we'll choose a candidate compound for further in vivo testing. But the problem that remains is that while some of these drugs we're testing are more modern and have less side effects than carbocol and pelocarpine, when they're taken by patients, they'll still quickly enter the bloodstream and travel to other organs in the body and may still have some unpleasant side effects. So to overcome this, we're collaborating with Azia Unciti Brusetta of the University of Edinburgh to develop a stable and local drug delivery system. So ASIA currently uses this technology to deliver stable chemotherapy drugs to locally target a tumour and he's published a number of manuscripts using this technology. In our project, we'll develop a stable precursor of our chosen drug by adding an extra structure to it as depicted in pink here, which is known as caging the drug and this renders it inactive. And the idea of using this system is that we can then reverse this or uncage the drug inside the salivary gland only, leaving an active drug in a specific place. So to test this in vivo, we've set up a model where we deliver gamma irradiation only to the neck of mice, shielding the rest of the body with lead, which mimics head and neck radiotherapy. So following analysis at various time points afterwards, we can see that this results in an initial increase in cell death, which we can see by the marker Bax, followed by DNA damage, indicated by the expression of the genes CHECK1 and CHECK2, which mirrors what patients experience following radiotherapy. So once we have our stable and inactive precursor of the chosen drug, we then surgically implant a catalyst bead into the salivary glands of mice that have been previously irradiated. And here you can see um, a high powered microscope image of what these beads look like. Following this, the inactive drug will then be administered to the mouse systemically, where it will be inactive in all organs of the body except where the catalyst is situated, minimizing off target effects. Where the compound comes into contact with the catalyst in the salivary gland, the catalyst will trigger cleavage or breaking of the additional prodrug portion of the drug, making it active locally. So collectively, these experiments will test a novel system to mimic neuronal signals in order to reactivate resident stem cells. So the end goal of this is to implant the catalyst in patients using a minimally invasive one-time surgery via ultrasound guidance. Following this, patients will self-administer the compound in the prodrug form daily, and only where it comes into contact with the catalyst will it become active, meaning that patients should see the benefit without the serious side effects associated with systemic administration. And the really nice thing about this is that the gland and the nerves maintain a reciprocal communication. So the gland itself produces factors that promote the growth of the nerves, which is the reason why we think we lose nerves following radiotherapy damage to the epithelia, to the salivary gland itself. And conversely, the nerves produce factors that keep the gland healthy and happy. So if we can restore the crucial neuronal signals to enable the gland to regenerate, we hope the gland will in turn produce factors to promote nerve regrowth. And ultimately, we hope that this approach will involve a short-term therapy with a self-sufficient and long-term outcome. So in summary, today I've shown you that SOX2 positive cells are required for acid cell replacement and that acetylcholine signalling from these nerves maintains SOX2 positive cells. So we're now testing an approach to see if mimicking acetylcholine signalling of the niche can promote endogenous regeneration via SOX2 positive progenitor cells. And ultimately, the lab is working to improve head and neck cancer patient quality of life. So with that, I'd just like to thank those in my lab who've been undertaking this and much more work to develop regenerative strategies for salivary gland injury. My postdoc, Cecilia, and my three PhD students, John, Ella, and Sonia. To all the previous members of my lab, 
my mentors and my collaborators and all of our funding sources. And this is our building in the Little France campus of the University of Edinburgh, based next to the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. And finally, to my father, John, who we lost to laryngeal cancer in 2005, but who's been my personal inspiration to follow this path. Thank you very much for listening. A horse goes into a bar. Bartender looks at him and says, why the long face? Hooray! Hooray! Hello everyone. I'm Jyoti Benjamin, a member of the Academy of Foods and Nutrition and a certified specialist in oncology, currently working at Kaiser Permanente, Bellevue, Washington State. Head and neck cancer patients undergoing treatment need a dietitian by their side on a regular basis, if not daily. The nutritional needs of head and neck cancer patients are unique and they correlate to the outcomes, short term as well as long term. There are numerous studies that support and collaborate the fact that good nutrition during cancer treatments can affect outcomes. Keeping this in mind, early nutrition intervention in head and neck cancer patients is very important. A dietitian can be a very valuable member as a part of the care team and an ally to the patient and the family. Have you ever wondered what happens inside a research laboratory or who the people are who are working on new treatments for head and neck cancer? Join me, Dr. Elaine Emerson, and members of my research team for a special virtual tour of our laboratory. Mucosamine mouthwash and oral spray can be used together to provide a convenient and effective way to help you with the effects of cancer therapy. The mouthwash and oral spray have been proven to reduce the symptoms of dry mouth, provide rapid pain relief and help treat and relieve the symptoms of oral mucositis. Hello, uh, Mike Heffernan here from uh, Dr Heff's Remarkable Mints. Uh, you may remember uh, Toby and I from uh, the conference last year. I can't believe a year has gone by. Uh, unfortunately, because of social distancing, Toby can't be in the same room. So I, I thought I'd bring uh, an, another alternative Toby along uh, to wish everybody uh, a great year. And hopefully next year we can all get back together again. Bye for now. I was a workaholic, super energetic, fit, healthy, and a really, really happy person. Didn't think for one second that, you know, cancer would hit me. Everything changed. Every waking moment, you appreciate everything much more. The hospital stay was really, for me, mentally challenging. I just wanted to have some inspiration, and in that environment, it's incredibly hard to find. I haven't spoke to a friend who was having treatment at the Rutherford. I decided to have a look. It doesn't feel like you're coming for cancer. It feels like you're just coming to get well. It's a positive experience rather than I'm having chemotherapy. I'm really excited about my future. My advice for anybody starting their journey would be to surround yourself with positive people and to ask yourself what do you want to do and go and do it. Hooray. Head and neck cancer is a brutal treatment. When you take the ability to communicate off somebody and to eat and drink, you stop being a human being. So what we're doing is, courtesy of one of our sponsors from America, we're actually sending patients what we call a boogie board. The boogie board is a, is a piece of equipment that the patient can write on it and then push a button and that text disappears. So we'll use this on our head and neck cancer ward for patients with communication difficulties, particularly after surgery, including laryngectomy. So the device allows you to write a message and then move on by deleting it automatically. And that's very useful for patients who can't speak, which is common after head and neck cancer surgery. Communication is very difficult after head and neck cancer surgery and it's frustrating for patients who can't communicate. 
uh, particularly if they've lost the use of their voice. So this kind of device is critical for communicating with family and caregivers and healthcare professionals during their inpatient stay. So the boogie board is a nicer way to communicate with your friends, your partner. It makes it so much easier for the patient to communicate. The Mouth Cancer Foundation and Swallows Head and Neck Cancer Charity have enjoyed a great relationship for many years. We are both passionate about supporting patients and carers every step of the way along their cancer journey. Working together makes us stronger, and when we are stronger, we can better serve everyone affected by the disease. Here we have another Edinburgh project on the role of liquid biopsy in management of head and neck cancer. Professor Tim Aitman is the director of the Centre for Genomic and Experimental Medicine within the MRC Institute of Genetics and Molecular Medicine. He is Professor of Molecular Pathology and Genetics at the University of Edinburgh and consultant physician in NHS Lothian. I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me to speak at this very exciting meeting. Uh, for those of us who are uh, working in genetics and genome science, it's a very exciting time, particularly when there's areas like liquid biopsy that are moving so fast, and at a time when there's real opportunities for translating our findings to patient care. So I was completely blown away by the YouTube and Eventbrite video that the organisers put together. And I could see that even though this is a virtual meeting, they were determined to make it fun. And so I'd like to give special thanks to one person in particular um, who, oh, um, no, I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, sorry. I'd like to give special thanks to Ian Nixon, who will be known to most of you in the organisation of the meeting. Ian, of course, is a head and neck cancer specialist in South East Scotland and has been a colleague and a friend for the last three or four years. Um, and amongst other things, he introduced me to head and neck cancer and is responsible for the work, um, introducing me to the work that I'm going to present in this talk. So um, this is a disclosure, an early access agreement for the Illumina platform. But the talk is essentially going to be in two parts. Firstly, because I'm aware that liquid biopsy may not be familiar to all of the audience. And so the first part of my talk will be an introduction to liquid biopsy. And in the second part of the talk, I will tell you about some of the work that we've done on liquid biopsy in head and neck cancer and why I think it's relevant to um, this meeting. So firstly, what is liquid biopsy? Well, most of you will be familiar with the idea or the concept of a surgical biopsy or a needle biopsy, where a surgeon or a radiologist will um, place a needle or take a little part of a tumor um, out of a patient so that it can be examined under a microscope. And this, of course, has been the traditional method of diagnosing um, cancers for many decades. A needle biopsy, a liquid biopsy, reflects the um, observation which has been known for um, about a decade that um, when tumours grow, some of the cells die and either are released into the circulation or they release their DNA into the circulation, the bloodstream. And therefore, the DNA and the circulating tumour cells carry the hallmarks of the cancer itself. And although, for example, cell-free DNA, as it's called, is present in very low concentrations in the bloodstream, that DNA, because it has the characteristics of the tumour, can give us huge amounts of information about what type of tumour it is and how it's likely to behave and whether it will respond to certain treatments. So that is the basis of the liquid biopsy. And there has been a, um, an explosion of interest in liquid biopsy over the past decade. Um, in biomedical research, we measure these things sometimes by the number of publications that have um, been 
um, submitted and published in the scientific literature and PubMed is the database that records these and you can see that liquid biopsy publications essentially did not exist before 2010 but in 2019 there were over a thousand publications on the subject of liquid biopsy so a massive amount of interest from the research and clinical communities but also there's been a huge interest commercially as well. This company, Grail, um, spun out of the world's leading DNA sequencing company called Illumina in 2017, raising an unprecedented $900 million to spin out. And then um, just two years later, in 2019, um, it had raised a total of $1.4 billion. And then in October of this year, Illumina decided it was so valuable that they bought the company back again, this time for $7 billion. And the diagnostics companies too have shown huge interest in liquid biopsy, and at least four or five of them have developed tests that have been approved by the regulators, in these cases by the Food and Drugs Administration in the States. And you can see that the most recent of these at the bottom, Garden360, has developed tests for advanced lung cancer and a pan-cancer test, a test across all, all cancers. And although the formal approval from the FDA was only granted in August of this year, by that time there had already been 150,000 tests that had been requested by physicians. And so you can see that it's a very popular field. Why is it so popular? Well, I'm going to show just um, a couple of slides that show you the power of liquid biopsy. This is a study of colon cancer from Melbourne in Australia, Jeannie Tai and colleagues. And what you can see is a representation of around 150 patients or so who were treated for type 2 colon cancer with surgery and then um, the question for type 2 colon cancer is, should these patients go on to receive chemotherapy? And this is uh, very controversial and undecided. But what they did was they sequenced the patient's tumour, the DNA from the patient's tumour, chose one genetic alteration from the tumour, and looked to see whether that alteration, that mutation, was present in the patient's bloodstream in their cell-free DNA six to ten weeks after circulation. And it doesn't require a scientist or a statistician to see that there is a major difference between those who are called CT DNA negative, meaning that they couldn't detect the tumor DNA in the circulation, and those who are CT DNA positive, shown in orange. And at 24 months, the CT DNA positive patients, they had all recurred, the disease had all recurred, shown by the orange curve that goes down to zero, who were recurrence free. By contrast, those who were CT DNA negative six to ten weeks after surgery, 90% of them or thereabouts were, C were recurrence free. And so um, this is a, a huge relative risk if you have circulating tumor DNA in the circulation after six to ten weeks and suggest that those patients would benefit from additional therapy such as chemotherapy. And so CDNA, CDNA positive in colon cancer is a major risk factor for disease recurrence. But it's not just colon cancer. And then the last three or four years this has been shown for a number of different cancers including on this slide pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, B-cell lymphoma, more recently bladder cancer has been shown to really predict those patients who do not need any further treatment at all. And so this is why, one of the reasons why liquid biopsy is so much um, valued by scientists and clinicians and patients as we move into um, the 2020s. So there are a number of different forms of liquid biopsy. I'm not going to refer to circulating tumor cells because that's still, I think, a scientific, mainly a scientific endeavor. We're looking at the DNA in the circulation of patients, the cell-free DNA. And we're looking for DNA mutations that originated in a patient's tumor. In the context of head and neck, 
we might be talking about DNA markers such as human papillomavirus or HPV. We might be looking for epigenetic changes, the chemical modifications that occur in a patient's DNA in the tumor cells, or fragment size, because we know that the fragments of DNA that you find in the circulation are smaller in patients' tumors than when they derive from healthy tissues. And in this talk, I'm just going to focus on the genetic changes, looking for the DNA mutations, and I'm going to start with DNA markers such as HPV. So I don't need to remind this audience the importance of head and neck cancer. It's the eighth commonest cancer in the UK. Um, in Scotland, it's been increasing rather worryingly over the past couple of decades from 17.3 per 100,000 in 1993, according to data from Public Health Scotland, to an annual incidence in 2017 of over 23 per 100,000, a 50% increase in incidence in a 20-year period. The major risk factors will be probably known to most of this audience. It occurs more in males than in females. It occurs at an older age. Smoking is a clear risk, particularly for HPV negative disease, and HPV positive infection, HPV infection, is known to be highly associated with those patients who develop the cancer. And the importance of human papillomavirus or HPV was really highlighted in a seminal paper in 2010. And this paper looked at patients with head and neck cancer, particularly oropharyngeal cancer, classified them according to whether they were HPV positive or negative, and then followed them for up to five years to see whether they responded well to treatment and whether they had prolonged survival. And again, you can see very clearly, those who were HPV positive did far better than those with HPV negative disease, with an overall survival of around 80% at five years, compared to under 50% for those who were HPV negative. And this realization of HPV as a major factor in certain oropharyngeal cancers um, has been used across cancers that are associated with human papillomavirus to see whether a blood test could detect HPV, so a liquid biopsy rather than a surgical biopsy. And back in 2016, this study from France um, was able to show that you could detect HPV in the cell-free DNA across a range of cancers in people who had HPV positive tumors. And in the last couple of years, that's been developed more um, specifically for HPV positive head and neck cancer. Um, these two studies um, by um, a group from North Carolina in the USA who developed assays called PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, to detect a very sensitive assay to detect um, um, HPV-derived DNA in the patients with head and neck tumors. And we decided to establish these in our lab, and I'm going to show you our experience with this assay in our lab over the past year or two. So firstly, when we established this assay, the DDPCR assay, it's a blood test, and we aimed to detect um, five serotypes, five different types of HPV in the plasma, in the blood cell-free DNA. These were HPV-16, which is the commonest cause of HPV-related oropharyngeal cancer, and the 18, 31, 33, and 35 serotypes, which are much less common. And you can see that the, um, each vertical line represents a patient, each row represents one of the um, serotypes. And to the left of the dashed line are um, red or black rectangles, the darker the color, the more HPV we were able to detect. Um, and the faint red is just a small number of copies of HPV. The darkest, the black, are the largest. And you can see that about 70% of the patients that we tested were positive for one or other of the serotypes. About 30% shown on the right of the dashed line are negative. So we wanted to know how that compared to the conventional way of testing for HPV on the patient's tumour. And this is the results of um, two uh, conventional tests. Um, the standard test, which is P0, 
P16 immunohistochemistry, which is a surrogate marker for P6, the presence of um, HPV. And then at the bottom, PCR for HPV on the tumor tissue. So both of the bottom tests are on tumor tissue, the top one is a blood test. And what you can see is that the overwhelming majority of patients who we found to be HPV positive at the top were also positive by P16 immunohistochemistry. Only one of them was not positive by P16 immunochemistry, but if you follow that line down to the bottom, you can see that actually that patient was positive by HPV PCR on the tumor tissue. For the negative cases, there was also a pretty good correlation. So the one-third of patients who were negative by our assay, the DDPCR, the cell-free DNA assay, most of those were also negative, not all of them, by P16 immunohistochemistry. But interestingly, two of the ones who were um, negative by um, our assay, but positive for P16, were also negative by HPV um, PCR. So um, we believe that our assay compares very favorably with the conventional assays. Overall, our DDPCR assay had 93% concordance compared to immunohistochemistry, 89% concordance compared with PCR of the solid tumor, and that compares with a concordance of 92% between the two conventional tests themselves. So we were fairly confident that our assays were pretty much as good as the conventional assays for defining whether a patient at presentation had a piece, had a, an HPV associated um, disease. But of course the great advantage of a blood test, the liquid biopsy, is that you don't only do it once when the patient presents because you have the tumour accessible to you. You can do it sequentially as often as you want from just a simple, single blood test. So we followed our patients after their initial treatment, which was by chemoradiotherapy, and we were very pleased to see in September of last year that all of the patients that had shown that were positive at presentation had um, decreased their levels of HPV to below the limits of detection of our assay. Some of them took a bit longer, up to 31 weeks to, um, for the HPV to disappear from their blood. Most of them had disappeared by 12 to 14 weeks. So we followed them a little bit further and then in January of this year we did a test on um, a larger number of patients and one of them as you can see here shown in dark grey at 23 weeks after treatment had shown a strongly positive result and because this is a logarithmic scale on the left hand side this had gone from less than one copy per mil of plasma to more than a hundred copies per mil of plasma a, a huge increase so to show this patient in a little bit more detail on the next slide what you can see is that the patient initially started off with around 10,000 copies per mil. By week seven, the patient had shown um, a decrease to below the limit of detec detection, and this was sustained to 18 weeks. But as I showed on the previous slide, by 23 weeks, more than 100 copies per mil. Now the patient was due to have, the assay was actually carried out at the beginning of this year, and um, the patient was due to, to have a scheduled CT scan um, at week 28 and after um, a uncertainty about whether this had progressed the CT scan was repeated a couple of times and it was decided to proceed to surgery when disease recurrence was confirmed. Now we followed the patient for quite a bit longer now and as you can see the levels had unfortunately remained high and by about 50 weeks um, the patient had developed new symptoms and a CT of the chest, a CT scan of the chest, showed that the patient had probably developed um, metastases, secondaries, in the lung. So um, what I think this shows is that firstly we can follow um, the course and the progression of the disease and the response to treatment with a, a blood test, the liquid biopsy for HPV, in those patients who are HPV positive, but that potentially, if we get the time points right, we can um, detect recurrence of disease before the scheduled imaging, which is obviously done less frequently than would be done with a standard blood test like the one that we've developed. I think the other interesting thing about this is the um, certainty 
with which um, the results can be interpreted. So on the right hand side are the results of CT and PET scanning which is done 12 weeks after treatment. And whilst 60% in this particular group had shown a complete response, about 40% showed a partial or no response. And obviously this creates great uncertainty for the patients and the clinicians then have to decide whether the patients are going to proceed to surgery, um, which is often difficult if the result of the scan is indeterminate. By contrast, at the same, in the same time window, which was 12 plus or minus 6 weeks, 90% of the patients had shown a complete drop in their HPV levels um, to less than one copy per mil. Only 10% had shown at this point in this, in this grouping um, uh, a, um, a failure to go down to zero. And of course there may be many reasons for that, why the HPV might not be released into plasma after treatment or that the response um, is complete but that cannot be determined by CT and PET scanning. So our results showed a 90% complete response compared to a 60% 60, 60 complete response by imaging and 20% of the imaging results at that time point in this series were considered indeterminate. Of course we've had a relatively short follow-up period and we are continuing to follow them up to see whether the results that we've obtained so far are sustained. So um, I, in the last uh, couple of minutes of the talk, what I would like to do is just show you some results um, which are very recent on HPV negative head and neck cancer. Because to some extent the HPV positive disease, it's easier to treat, the results are better, and the DDPCR result that we've used, that we've developed, can be used for all patients um, because it's a single assay, an HPV assay, whereas there is not a single biomarker for patients with HPV negative disease. So what we've chosen to do is to take a different liquid biopsy approach using a, a platform developed by Illumina, the TSO500 platform, which sequences 500 genes in the patient's cell-free DNA. And it sequences, sequences them to considerable depth and it looks for genetic alterations or mutations that might be associated with the cancer, might be associated with a good or a bad prognosis, and might indicate what treatment would be suitable for the patients and which, ones that, which treatments they would best respond to. So this is rather a complicated image here, but what you need to know is that each of the, on the left hand side, these are names of cancer genes that are commonly mutated or commonly affected in head and neck cancer, and each of the green or red or purple dots, um, rectangles, shows a mutation, a genetic alteration in that patient. And each column represents one of the five patients that we were able to study pre-treatment on the left and post-treatment on the right. And I've also indicated at the bottom whether the imaging showed that the patient had responded completely or a partial or no response. And we had three who showed um, after, with imaging a partial or no response, and three or two who had a complete response. And what you can see is that there is a scattering of mutations detected in these cancer genes. Some of them are more um, easy to interpret than others, and some of them are more obviously serious than others. For example, the red um, rectangles for TP53 are known to be very um, major indicators of cancer and almost certainly contributed to why those patients developed cancer. And what you can see is that those two red rectangles at the top in TP53 had disappeared after treatment and these were in patients who had a partial or no response. And so um, maybe um, we don't know exactly how to interpret that, but maybe this means that um, uh, if they continue have to have treatment that's related to TP53, then um, maybe they would do as well as the patients who showed a complete response. But the actual um, number of mutations is perhaps difficult to interpret. Perhaps what is easier to interpret is the frequency with which we found those mutations in plasma, or the variant allele frequency. And what we can see for the TP53 is that whilst 80% um, of the patients had TP53 mutations pre-treatment, only 40% of them did after treatment, suggesting that maybe the parts of the tumour where TP53 was present 
have actually been eliminated and we will wait to see whether that is associated with a good long-term um, result or not. What we can also see is we can measure the variant allele frequency, the frequency with which we saw the TP53 mutations, and you can see that in the four patients who initially had a TP53 mutation found, the number of times that we found that variant in, in the circulation had dramatically decreased after chemotherapy. And so we're now looking to study these patients further, to study them for a longer period of time, and also um, to study a larger group of patients with this technology, with the sequencing technology, um, to see whether um, we can expand the results and show something that is clinically useful. So I'll end now by saying that I hope I've convinced you that liquid biopsy is a powerful technique for diagnosing and monitoring many cancer types and have started to enter clinical practice, but that measuring HPV levels as a liquid biopsy in head and neck cancer can complement existing tests and show potential for disease monitoring and early detection of recurrence. In our HPV negative cancers, we believe that we can detect tumour-derived mutations in the circulation and we're now going to undertake further work to demonstrate whether this is a clinically useful test. So I finally need to thank my colleagues, particularly John Thompson, who's led the analysis of the head and neck cancer data, along with the rest of my team who've been working on this, Sophie Martina, Duncan, Sophie, Prasoon and Helen. Um, the head and neck cancer team have been superb and Ian has been a terrific colleague who's recruited um, now more than a hundred patients in a relatively short space of time along with the his colleagues in um, surgery, virology and pathology whose results I've presented to you today and of course we're grateful to um, the funding agencies particularly in Scotland the Chief Scientist's Office and the Guthrie Fund um, from ENT Scotland who fund funded a pilot work and finally, although you're not mostly maybe in Scotland, I'll end with what I think is the most fabulous view that I've had in the past five years in Scotland, which is the view of Loch Ninny from the top of Ben Nevis. And I encourage you to visit Scotland when you're able to. And with that, I will conclude and be happy to take any questions. I saw a patient the other day. I said, sorry, but you get six months to live. He said, I don't think I could have paid my bill for another 12 months anyway. I looked at his chart, I said, I think you got 12 months to live. Hello, my name is Rebecca Spurn. I'm a dietitian with Northwell Health, Department of Radiation Medicine. I work with outpatient oncology patients. I think that it's really important and beneficial for a patient with head and neck cancer to work with a dietitian because in the situation that a cancer patient is in, there are many, many things that are out of your control. But how a person chooses to manage their nutrition and what they eat is something that they can control. And this is something that dietitians can be really helpful with. When I'm working with a cancer patient, my two main focuses are to try to help them manage their symptoms and to also try to help them get the calories and protein and fluids that they need to get through the treatment as strong as possible. And I think that every head and neck cancer patient who is affected so much by their treatment, because of the nature of the treatment, it really affects their ability to eat. And I think that we as dietitians can be so helpful in maximizing a person's ability to get the nutrition they need to be as strong as possible throughout their treatment. In addition, I think that dietitians can be really helpful in teaching healthy eating habits and not the least of which, we can also be very supportive emotionally for all the challenges that patients are encountering. The University of Edinburgh's Centre for Regenerative Medicine would like to take you behind the scenes of our research. Join me, Dr Elaine Emerson, for a special virtual tour of my laboratory and to find out more about our research into new treatments for patients recovering from radiotherapy. Mucosamine mouthwash is a soothing mouthwash designed to become part of your usual daily dental routine. 
it's not always practical to carry the mouthwash around with you, so Mucosamin Oral Spray comes in a convenient 30ml bottle with a long nozzle to help you get those hard to reach areas in your mouth for fast targeted relief when and where you need it. Hi, the cone, hello, hey. Just wanted to come and say hi and it. Now Mike's gone, I can take that off. Uh, it's Toby from Dr. Hess, just wanted to say hi and a thanks to uh, Sharon and Chris for letting us come and say uh, hello on this virtual conference. Um, sorry we can't be there today, but i really looking forward to next year, so hopefully we can meet each other face to face again. Have a great conference and see you again soon. Cheers then. Hi everybody. My name is Mark Lawler and I'm from Queen's University in Belfast. I'm Scientific Director of DataCan, the UK's health data research hub for cancer. We see data as being a little bit like oil and just like oil it needs to flow and then we can use that data to help us in earlier diagnosis of cancer and in providing better treatments for cancer patients. Despite having no symptoms whatsoever, somebody sits in front of you and says, I'm sorry to tell you, Mr. Colgrove, that you have prostate cancer. I have a routine blood test every year, and then I had the MRI, and that's when they found a P-shaped tumour in me. In fact, it was through you that I found out about proton therapy. The actual treatment with the protons takes less than two minutes aside, and that's quicker than a slice of toast. Seeing the tech and the facilities is all fine and it's smart and it's plush, but that counts for nothing if the people aren't giving you a feeling of security and support. And that's what the Rutherford Centre did so well. Oh, flipping heck! <laughs> Hi, I'm Liam from Flynn Health. We know that most patients undergoing radiotherapy treatment will suffer some kind of skin reaction to this treatment, which is why Flamagel RT is clinically proven to reduce the effects of radiotherapy-induced skin reaction. Over 90% of patients say that it soothed the pain and the heat from their reaction with its cooling effect, and it reduces the intensity of that red, dry, itchy, irritated skin. And it's easy to apply. It's not sticky or greasy, and it dries on the skin very quickly, allowing you to get dressed and get on with the rest of your day. Well, thank you all for watching the virtual International Head and Neck Cancer Conference. But before we finish, we're now going live to Chris for a special announcement. Hi everyone, and uh, welcome to the Q&A session. So, um, as you heard there, we've got a little bit of a special announcement to make. And uh, what I wanna do is obviously talk about our health awards. Um, throughout the last six months, people have been sending in their nominations for our health awards. First time we've ever done this at the conference. And uh, we went through all the nominations from all around the world. And there were some incredible nominations. And we shortlisted it in the end to three people um, and three units. And those are... Brandy Page from John Hopkins Hospital, Baltimore, USA. And we've got Maureen Jansen. She's from Iowa, New Zealand, and she's nominated the Auckland Region Multidisciplinary Team. And we've got Sean Amico, for our, who nominated the Province Cancer Institute in um, the USA. So they were the last three that we got through um, and it was very, very hard to then try and pick one of those teams. And uh, I've got some great news. 
The panel then selected, and I think he's here somewhere, are they? Um, maybe not. So let me just look. Sharon, is he not home now? So, okay. The winner was Sean Amico from the Province Cancer Institute. Um, what they get is um, they get £500 courtesy of the Rutherford Cancer Centres and they can use that for anything that they need in their head and neck cancer department. And Sean gets um, a gift voucher for nominating and so do the Maureen and Brandy will also get gift vouchers. So we will be letting that they all know that where they've got the winner or they've come second or third and we'll be announcing that on Twitter and on social media after this session. But well done to all the nominees and obviously well done to the three winners. So with that, I'm going to hand over to the wonderful Dominic, who's going to chair this meeting. Dominic is from the Frontier Oncology Journal and he's their, their journalist has supported the um, Swallows since we met in ESMO. I don't know whether it was last year or the year before. I can't remember now. Time goes so damn quick. But they do a lot of um, supporting of the Swallows and the work that we do. So they came up with this idea about doing a research award and they've sponsored the award. And I'll let Dominic, Dominic talk all about it now. So I'm going to go on mute and that's over to you, Dominic. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. So firstly, thank you, uh, Chris and Sharon and the entire Swallows organization for um, inviting me to, to chair this session. Um, and also just, uh, you know, I, th I think it's worth mentioning just how terrific the work is um, that you have been doing, especially this year, um, considering all the uh, circumstances. Um, so just a little bit about Frontiers in Oncology. We are a peer-reviewed academic journal. Uh, we publish on a range of different uh, cancer types. Uh, both translational research as well as uh, more clinical things. One of our main sections is the head and neck cancer section, um, which is chiefed by uh, Professor Jan Vermorken um, from Belgium, uh, Kevin Harrington from um, the UK, and Andreas Steeds from Germany. So you may be familiar with some of those people and, uh, and their research. Um, so this is the first time the conference has done a research awards um, portion, and uh, this was an idea Chris and I discussed earlier this year, and it's really great to see um, this take fruition, uh, despite, um, you know, everything that's gone on this year. Um, so what I will do is uh, just introduce the different award categories and the winners who are all um, with us. Um, we had a very, uh, really high quality um, submissions on a range of different topics. Um, so the three award categories was the best scientific submission, the best clinical submission, and the best overall submission. And the panel of judges who are all um, here today helped um, pick these winners. Um, but as I said, they were all really high quality submissions, and I would welcome them to um, submit to the journal as full papers. Um, and I would be very happy to, to communicate with, with any of the submitters um, to get some more information about that. So without further ado, I would like to um, congratulate the winner of the best scientific submission as John McKendrick from the University of Edinburgh um, for the submission, Deciphering the Role of Macrophages During Salivary Gland Regeneration. So congratulations, John. I don't know if you'd like to say um, just, you know, maybe a quick two minute summary of, um, of the research and where you're going with that right now. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed reading the poster and uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing the, uh, the new results um, from your current work that you're doing. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Um, yeah, I'm very honoured to be selected. Thank you very much. Um, as Elaine alluded to, we're interested in the nerves and the cell that I'm interested in communicates with the nerve and transfers this signal to other cells within the gland. And that's the macrophage. And we're looking right now at how we can target different pathways involved in nerve signal transduction between these and the epithelia to help regeneration. And uh, I look forward to actually getting to meet people in real life, perhaps in the future, and talk more about this kind of research. Thanks very much. Great. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> as a part of the award, John will be receiving a um, B-type waiver for the journal, which is uh, worth $1,900. So this will go towards uh, hopefully submitting uh, a paper to us, um, as well as a, an Amazon voucher just to get you through the winter period. 
So the next award is for the best clinical submission. So we had actually um, quite a few clinical submissions that were really um, thinking back to something that Arthur said yesterday, which is all about survival outcomes and quality of life after treatment. And I think that all of the clinical submissions uh, were, and actually all the submissions generally, were all really in that spirit. It was all about really imp improving the quality of life for patients after cancer. And I remember this is something Chris said to me when we first met uh, at ESMO last year, which seems like an eternity ago, but he said, you know, it's all about survivorship without quality of life is, is really, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's not ideal. So um, great submissions. So the winner of the best clinical submission is Lucy Lee. Um, for her title, Thyroid Function Post-Laryngectomy and Hemithyroidectomy, Do All Laryngectomy Patients Need Replacement? So congratulations, Lucy. I would like to invite you to, um, yeah, just to say a few words about uh, the study and about the, the outcomes and the recommendations. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, my name is Lucy, I'm one of the core surgical trainees working in Edinburgh. And over the past year or so, we performed a retrospective cohort study that essentially looked at the incidence of hyperthyroidism amongst patients who underwent laryngectomy with hemithyroidectomy rather than a total thyroidectomy and the clinical factors that uh, may increase the incidence. Um, one of the reasons why we looked at this is because whilst um, there are guidelines in place for patients that undergo complete removal of their thyroid and they usually um, get started on empirical thyroid replacement, it's a little bit unclear for patients that only have half their thyroid removed. So we wanted to see um, what proportion of patients actually end up developing hyperthyroidism and whether or not it's also worthwhile starting them on empirical therapy as well. So. Essentially, um, the results of our study show that 80.2% of patients did end up developing hypothyroidism, um, with 50% of patients uh, becoming hypothyroid within about 10 months. On the basis of this, um, we would recommend that um, due to this high incidence and the potential for adverse effects associated with hypothyroidism within this group of patients, such as problems with wound healing, um, we would advocate starting thyroid replacement following laryngectomy surgery and um, organizing regular postoperative thyroid function tests for at least five years postoperatively. Great. Congratulations once again, and a very, very important study that I think, um, as I said, really embodies uh, improving quality of life for, for patients. So now moving on to the best overall submission. So there was a, yeah, a lot of debate about uh, what, what should be the best overall submission. And as I said, we really did have very high quality submissions. Um, joining us from Australia for the best overall submission is Dr. Arutha Kulasing um, for his submission, Profiling the Tumor Microenvironment Using Digital Spatial Profiling. Very important study, very relevant as well. So I'd like to invite, um, Arutha, to, to talk a bit about your, um, about your work. And uh, yeah, greetings from Australia. Thanks for joining us uh, from all the way. Perfect. Thanks, Dominic. Can you hear me? Great. So the, uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. So it's, uh, it's 10.30 p.m. here in Brisbane, so it's a bit late at night, but it's a great meeting. I've been uh, listening to all the talks and then yesterday, too. So just a brief about my project and what's been going on. So I've been looking at uh, predictive biomarkers for immunotherapy in head and neck cancer. And, and one way I'm trying to tackle this is by spatially profiling the tumor microenvironment. So there are other ways. And I think the previous speaker talked about uh, the tumor mutation burden and um, certain aspects that you could look at. Uh, so the TSO500 is being looked at by Illumina. So we're using tumor tissue. So what, the beauty of this technology is that you can use archival tissue going back about 20 years, and you can essentially look at about 100 proteins of a single tissue section or up to 20,000 mRNA targets. And you can look at um, the microenvironment at a greater depth than has been previously possible. So I've done this for a number of um, head and neck cancer samples. We've done about 20 in the last uh, couple of weeks. And these are all from patients that have received checkpoint inhibitor therapy in the metastatic setting. And, and what, what we found is that um, that higher knowledge, you know, we were looking at CD8 cells infiltrating the tumor would be predictive of outcome. That's what we thought going in, but we found that 
a number of other markers, a, a few immunomodulatory markers that were of interest to so Sing, Vista, IDO1. These are sort of targets that are being looked at outside the PD1, PDL1 um, realm of, 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 of markers. So we're now trying to hone in and look at the global expression in the tissue as well as the tumor expression and, 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 and the immune cells on, on the periphery of the tumor and those that are infiltrating. And it was a really small study, but I think it shows the beauty of this technology and marrying that at protein and that RNA data can be really, really powerful uh, to potentially identify pr uh, patients that would uh, respond to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Thank you. So congratulations very much on that. I also believe that you your abstract was also selected at ASCO, so um, ACR rather. So congratulations on that as well. Huge achievement. So um, congratulations to everyone that submitted and for the uh, the winner. So um, as I mentioned, um, both John and Lucy will be receiving B-type waivers worth um, nineteen hundred dollars um, to go towards submitting towards our uh, our journal, and Arutha will be receiving a A-type waiver worth uh, twenty nine hundred dollars. Uh, likewise, that goes towards submitting to the journal. So um, I'm looking forward to chatting, uh, chatting to you all afterwards, and we can uh, figure out um, the logistics of that. Um, so moving on from the awards portion, I'm um, looking forward to now discussing the, the Q and A. So we've received a lot of great questions from uh, from the audience, um, and I would like to um, begin um, by asking. So this is from uh, Nick Vanderveld um, to Mary Wells and Joe Brett. Um, He's asked, what is the new um, PET CT as opposed to the usual PET CT I have? Um, so I would like to um, yeah, open, open it up for you to answer that. Thanks very much, um, Joe. I don't know if you want me to start, but I think um, when I think Joe may, may have said new PET CT, but actually I put in the chat that um, we're talking about the PET CT that you are currently having. Um, it's only new in that I don't know. I mean, it's probably we've probably now been doing routine PET CTs for about five years, have we? At Ian Arthur, I should think you can confirm that. But it's relatively new in that we used to use um, normal CT scans and not PET CT. So actually, it's the same thing that you're probably having, Nick. Don't know if Arthur or, or um, Ian want to add anything to that. Yeah, I, I can add to that. It, it is the same one, Nick. Um... And, uh, you know, it, it, as you said, though, it is, uh, you know, Mary, it's relatively new in terms of the fact that we've been doing it over the last five years and it's moved from, you know, something that was sort of experimental or early on to something we use pretty frequently. And just a couple of things about the PET CT, you know, we, we had hoped it was going to be this all or none. If, if you have cancer, it lights up. And if you don't have cancer, it's negative and you can give people a clean bill of health. But as we know, um, physiologic activity, for instance, the arytenoid cartilages of the vocal cord will often light up just because of the motion there. Um, the base of tongue lymphatic tissue will sometimes show activity there. So there is some interpretation with that. But that being said, um, you know, it's an extremely important test. And, and one thought I had, cause we're in the US is uh, we sometimes have trouble getting insurance companies to pay for PET CTs. So as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, I can imagine an insurance company saying, well, did you do routine exams on the patient before you're doing the PET CT? So we do run into that sometimes. Otherwise I, I think you're, um, your study is really intriguing because patient asks us all the time, do I have to keep coming back? Do I have to do, you know, we do every three months for the first two years, every six months for the um, next three, and then once a year for the rest of their lives after five years out. So, and probably a little more frequently and as the patient, uh, as um, we heard yesterday uh, with adenoid cystic, because those can recur 10 to 20 years out, we probably see those patients more frequently than once a year and they get out five years. So very intriguing around the PET CT. Great, thank you. Um, and a question again, um, aimed at uh, Joe and Mary. So um, you touched on telecare um, briefly and how that has really, um, in some ways COVID has kind of forced the acceleration um, with regards to embracing telecare. And actually it would be interesting to, to get input from, from all the patients seeing um, people on this panel is what your experience has been of um, telecare's effectiveness and what you think still needs to perhaps be addressed with regards to the effectiveness of telecare. And perhaps it would be interesting to get a, an American perspective as well as a um, UK-based perspective to see how telecare um, is different and what are the different barriers to uh, effective telecare. 
Well, I speak to the UK experience, or, or at least the Edinburgh experience, because it's probably been different in different parts of the world and different parts of the UK. But we switched from uh, having quite a rigid face-to-face -face review policy um, as per UK guidelines, really, to uh, seeing patients less often face-to-face -face and offering telephone reviews in between. Um, obviously, you can't examine the patient. Uh, that was discussed a little yesterday, the, the, the difficulty of examination even with a video link is very challenging. But the reason that patient-led follow-up is so useful is that most patients will be symptomatic. So it's convenient for patients, particularly when there are different waves of risk of coming to places like hospital. I think that represents some value to patients. It's convenient that they don't have to travel, particularly as we heard yesterday, some people travel out of area. Uh, so, but there are limitations and so there are some we stratified our patient group into patients that we really felt we needed to continue examining. Those patients that we thought examination had less importance uh, and then individualize their follow-up based on that. Dominic, I could speak to that from the US standpoint if you want. Um, so first of all, one of my backgrounds besides being a head and neck surgeon is I'm a computer geek. I got my informatics uh, master's about um, five years ago, went back to school. And uh, so I've been, I jumped on the telehealth bandwagon very early on, as soon as it was available in the um, electronic medical record that we use. And we don't, we're not on a national record. We all have individual records. And I embraced it for follow-ups in part because, um, you know, as Ian said, patients can come from far away. I see some patients from really far away. The other thing is that in the United States, when patients show up for a visit, they have to pay a copay. Sometimes it's 50 to $100 that they have to pay out of pocket. And I found that if I could limit their visits, I could limit that. Now, I will be honest, a lot of physicians in the United States want to make money and they don't get paid for televisits, so they wouldn't do them. Uh, Chris knows me well. I do a lot of free care. And so I don't mind uh, not charging patients for those visits, but it works out really well. You know, as I joked yesterday, it's very hard to do a fiber optic telescope exam, uh, tele, you know, on telemedicine. You try to put it through the computer screen, but it just doesn't work. But the reality is that um, I can gain a lot of information from my patients and I can tell them whether they need to come in for an exam or, um, you know, I can just uh, sort of assure them that everything sounds great. So there really are some benefits to it. During COVID, the insurance company started paying for it. Um, so, you know, all of a sudden we've got physicians jumping on the bandwagon and unfortunately some people are overusing it. I think our government's gonna pull that back once, uh, once if COVID ever ends. Um, it is a great tool to keep patients engaged without having to come physically to the hospital and it opens up visits for sicker patients so you can get them in. Dominic, can I just say, uh, obviously Arthur mentioned, the, the mentioned his work he does. I've been out to that hospital and, you know, I've met other hospitals in the, in the States and a couple of the other hospitals I met, the first thing you see is a big sign with credit card numbers and stuff on it. And you don't even get past the window without putting your credit card underneath. But Arthur's hospital, I have to say, money is not what the driver is. And I know for a fact that Arthur does an awful lot. And I've seen on Facebook when he brings his team on a Saturday and a Sunday, to do free work on patients. And that's why we work so closely with Arthur. He's a true gentleman and he's realistically, we should have him in the NHS. You never know, a semi-retirement plan. <laughs> Ian, Ian, get him into Scotland. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Thank you for your answers on that. So, Will do. Uh, quest oh, sorry. A question uh, directed, um, or Gillian Knight, from, so this is from Rob Scott Daniels. Are there any statistics available regarding the rates of recurrence for oropharyngeal cancer resulting from HPV-16 patients having a disease-free classification post-treatment? Good question, and one that I don't personally have the answer to. Um, I know that we're looking into more and more around understanding how likely patients are to reoccur once treatment has commenced, partly because obviously when we're doing some of that treatment, if we don't get all the HPV out of that infected area, there could be potentially chance of that actual virus coming back and then recreating those cancers later on down the line. 
I think some of the reason that kind of data is starting to emerge and will continue to emerge as we gain a better understanding of those cancers that are HPV positive, and therefore as they represent at clinic, are they still HPV positive cancers that have come back? And I know that I've spoken to a number of clinicians, and when they do some of their surgery, including particularly around the robotic side of it, it's ensuring that we try and get as much of the healthy tissue around that infected area as well to reduce that chance of HPV reoccurrence. Because what we don't really know is then, how much infectious virulence is in the mouth as we're doing that surgery that may actually spread around. So personally, I don't have the statistics to hand. Arthur might do more from that area than myself, but I do know it's something that we will be looking into more as we gain a better understanding of HPV and the role it plays in head and neck cancer. Yeah, it's uh, very interesting. That's a great question. You know, I, I think the reality is that, um, as you said, uh, Julian, the data is still coming out on that. You know, what we do know about HPV is that uh, it is a different behaving tumor. I'm sure uh, Ian and Dominic and other people here can speak to that. Uh, it has changed the whole classification scheme. So the, the TNM classification, you know, how we stage the tumors is now different uh, if you're HPV positive versus using the old system where you're HPV negative. And that has really helped us tailor treatment so that, you know, in general, we can be a little less aggressive, or at least that's what we're moving towards for HPV. Uh, positive and to decrease some of the side effects. What we do see is that uh, in general, we, we seem to think it has a much better prognosis um, than the HPV negative tumors. So patients seem to do better with that. And, and I think we've thought also that there's less of a recurrence rate, although we have to monitor that. A couple of interesting things with HPV, HPV positive patients who smoke have been shown in the data to actually do worse than HPV negative patients who smoke, um, which is strange. And the few bad recurrences I've seen, and probably this is a little more anecdotal, but people have written case reports about this, probably a much more aggressive recurrence is when they happen. I've had the only patient um, I've ever seen with presentation of metastatic disease in the bone uh, on, a, on an HPV positive as one of our nurses' husbands. I took care of him. He, had, he came in with a... Uh, Tumor. It was very interesting. Uh, a close friend of his also had HPV positive, um, uh, and also his father had HPV negative cancer. So there's some weird stuff there. But he presented with tonsil cancer, basically with a, a node in his neck, small tonsil cancer, chemo rads, did really well. The carpenter then had some back pain and thought it was from work, and then it got worse, and he came in, and his PET scan lit up in his sacrum and in his lum lumbar spine without any disease in the lung or anywhere else. So... Uh, you know, we're sort of learning as we go and, and the work you're doing is going to be tremendous with this. And I think just to follow up on that comment that Arthur had around the smoking and the relation to HPV head and neck cancer. Again, that is something that we're looking into more because the mouth is really quite a strange place for a virus to live. It's really quite an aggressive place for a virus to live. And we do wonder if the virus is not quite undertaking its normal viral life cycle in the mouth in comparison to say if it was infecting the genital regions. And of course, the minute you put things like smoking in there, which has got mutagenic ability anyway, in that mouth, how much is that increasing that likelihood of the virus becoming oncogenic is something we need to know. But we're also seeing some of the other work that I've done as well is it does seem to increase the risk of picking up an oral HPV infection, probably because it may be damaging the mucosal lining of the mouth, allowing HPV to get in. Or, as I like to say to all my students, smoking is bad, full stop, because it also means your immune system reduces and therefore maybe you're less likely to fight that viral infection off. So I think the HPV side of it in the mouth is going to be a very interesting area that will keep us from a virology perspective entertained if we're not talking about COVID. Yes, that's a very good point at the end there. Um, so another question um, for you is, um, this is from Karen Gunnar online saying, um, I would be very interested to know how many women um, that have had an HPV positive smear are given advice on prevention of spread. Yeah, we're in the UK, now that we are changing some of our triage system around where we're actually looking for HPV positive samples in a cervical smear, rather than looking for abnormalities of um, cervical changes, there is more information given to, to patients, to uh, women around what HPV means to them and how the virus can be important in regards to their health. Overall, though, I still think you find that HPV 
is kind of that second conversation around the development of cancer. So the fact that it is a virus that can cause cancer is probably more unknown in most people. When you speak to people in the general public, they will talk about cervical cancer and not necessarily aware that there is a virus underpinning it. So I would say I think we're getting better about showing those links between HPV and cervical cancer, maybe not so much with the oral side, and that's something that we do really need to be improving on. And that's probably more because of the way we're changing our system of testing within the UK, particularly raising awareness of HPV testing rather than cervical abnormalities. And just related to that, um, based on you know the experience of speaking to um, you know primary school children. Considering the, the global kind of climate right now, especially with this kind of push of, um, you know, hesitancy towards vaccinations and, you know, let's call it as it is, this anti-vax movement, um, was that something that was uh, at all noticeable when, when talking to, to the children? Was, was there any hesitancy towards vaccines? Um, would be interesting to know at what point does that become a thing and, and how that hinders, uh, hinders this? No, we, we didn't find any of any of the kids um, were, con were having anti-vax. Their biggest concern, particularly from the boys, was what it would hurt. And they didn't actually want to have a sore arm. And some of the, the bits when we came back and we asked the boys, why would you would you want to be vaccinated? One of the questions answers came back was no, because it will hurt. So I think you're realising you're still dealing with quite even though they're 12 to 13 year olds. Um, 11 to 12 years they're still fairly young in their thinking and they're very strongly influenced by their parents decision making on this and it's been useful for me my my daughter did get vaccinated last year in 2019 she was the first year where in the UK we vaccinated boys and girls and I was very much pleased to see that the boys reverted back to type as I remembered at school and hitting each other on the arm where they've just been vaccinated so it's good to know 20 years later boys still act the same way but from another point of view, only anecdotal evidence for my particular school, most of the boys did have the vaccine as well. So it does seem to be getting through that that vaccination is important for both males and females. But certainly if you spoke to my daughter, who mum is a HPV knowledge, she really doesn't understand why she's having the vaccine. She just knows it can prevent a cancer and that's what's important. Yes, yeah, so, okay. that, that is at the end of the day, the, the important message to get across to them. Um, excellent. So uh, I have a question. So um, Elaine Emerson, that was an extremely comprehensive study with uh, with a lot of information, and it was uh, really terrific to see in just in how much detail um, you went and and, and whatnot. Um, so there was a so there was a comment um, actually from from Mary Wells um, just about the recent announcement of the new salivary tu tuberial uh, tuberial glands, and um, you know potentially um, what what role it could play or, or if any um, in this case. Um, so I would be very interested to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, so it's, um, it's an incredibly exciting discovery. And I think um, it's something, there, there are glands that we just didn't even know existed. Um, and I'd be really intrigued to know a little bit more about whether they're negatively affected by, by radiotherapy in the same way that we see the three major glands and again for, for our interest whether they're as innovated surrounded by nerves as the three glands that we study are um because that's sort of our our key mechanism that we look at so that could be transferred across to other other new newly discovered salivary glands as well um, but i think at the moment it's just a really exciting discovery has it uh, has it caused you to shift up your um, your follow-up studies your follow-up investigations at all or so not not yet. Um, I think first and foremost, we'd have to try and work out if they exist in, in our mouse models and where they are, because primarily what we work on is mouse models as our sort of first port of call. And then we integrate a lot of um, human tissue into our studies. Um, and I have a connection with Ian um, to be able to get that from surgery. But until we get to a stage where we're sort of really truly doing um, in man studies, mouse is our kind of model organism um, and at the moment I have no idea where those glands would be in the mouse <laughs> we might have to do some some uh, preliminary dissections and see if we can work out where they are but very exciting and actually just on the topic of um of salivary glands uh, this is a question actually to, to you John 
Um, so I was reading um, some research earlier, um, which was just about macrophages and their role in um, the salivary gland regeneration and some talk about the um, obviously M1 and M2 macrophages and the different role that's being played there. Um, judging by the smiles on your faces, I presume this is something um, you have looked at and just if you have any kind of uh, early hypothesis, so to speak, about which um, type of macrophages is being lost and uh, make perhaps which type um, of action is uh, perhaps more important in, in salivary gland regeneration? Yeah, I've, um, I've seen a lot about M1, M2. Of course, in other tissues, it's been kind of pulled apart a lot more clearly and very little is known about the salivary gland macrophages. And so we have looked at different markers which might um, separate the macrophages into different subpopulations. And it's possible that like in other tissues, there are populations associating with the nerve tissue, which are kind of these more pro-regenerative macrophages, which are involved in the outgrowth of blood vessels and nerves as well. And of course, if that's true, that's really important in terms of understanding what population is lost after this damage. Is there a shift in this population to a kind of more inflammatory phenotype? And is our aim to restore the resting state or is it to actually restore the balance that there was before? Because with injury, you need this inflammatory state and then you need this kind of recovery as well. But in the human model, which we don't look at as much is you've got fractionated irradiation. So you actually almost have it worse because it is a chronic inflammatory model. You have very little chance of recovery from that kind of chronic inflammatory state. And we're going to look at this as well. And I think it would be really interesting to see, you know, in chronic inflammation in this tissue, is it like other models where you have a loss of this M2 state? It would be interesting, uh, interesting to see how that follows up. Um, so a question for uh, Professor Tim Aitman. So liquid biopsy has obviously seen a lot of success um, in, in various cancers, particularly those which obviously are not fixed in, in one place. So um, I've done some, one of my roles is looking at hematologic malignancies. So obviously um, it's been quite big there. Um, one thing that um, I've seen quite a lot lately is the potential application of um, real-time liquid biopsy and how useful that can be. Um, and I would just be interested in hearing your thoughts on um, where we are with real-time liquid biopsy and whether that would be something that could play an, an important role um, in this particular setting. So, so um, thank you, Dominic. I assume when you mean real time, you mean by sequential study, sequential blood tests. And um, I think that this is um, probably only just, we're only just starting to know um, what the answer to that question is. There haven't been that many sort of prospective clinical trials to test this out. So we're still working to some extent on retrospective studies and anecdotes. But I think the, um, what we do know, for example, Cell-free DNA has a remarkably short half-life in the circulation. So um, it's really from studies in pregnant women because you can detect fetal DNA in the circulation. After a woman has delivered, the cell-free DNA drops with a half-life of about 30 or 40 minutes. And so essentially any cell-free DNA that is released from a tumor will be gone within a matter of 12 hours or certainly 24 hours. It will have completely disappeared. And so when we're looking at the cell-free DNA from a tumor, we are looking at the DNA that has been released from a tumor very recently and is due to turnover of cells over that period of time. We looked at, um, a, um, we looked at the cell-free DNA in head and neck cancer when the patients came to clinic. And of course, that's been a little problematic in the last year because or in the last six months because patients have not been attending so frequently. We've heard the discussion about telemedicine. I think that um, for my view is that for HPV positive head and neck cancer, there is little doubt that in my mind, it's going to become a routine part of healthcare. And it won't just be a question of checking it, you know, six to 10 weeks after surgery or chemo radiotherapy, as has been done as the colon cancer study that I mentioned did. I think that will give you a strong indication of how frequently people need to be followed up. But I think because there's likely to be recurrences over a three or five year period, that um, it's going to be a question of deciding how frequently the tests need to be done. I would imagine probably that the likelihood is that they'll continue to be done, or they will likely be done every three to four months, 
and that probably that will have a major impact on how frequently imaging needs to be done. Perhaps once the studies are really certain, imaging could be done less frequently, and particularly in HPV positive head and neck cancer, um, frequent blood tests with less frequent imaging might become the norm. Great. Um, and I actually just, just received a question from uh, someone in the panel just uh, to get your thoughts on circulating tumor cells um, in head and neck cancers and, and the role they play. Yeah, well, um, we've focused almost exclusively on cell-free DNA. And, um, but there are a number of different um, sort of uh, reagents, if you like, a number of different things that you can measure in the bloodstream. Circulating tumor cells is one. Um, platelets, we believe that there could be platelet educated, um, tumor educated platelets that tell you something about um, the tumor and also microRNAs from microvesicles as well. So my view is that um, cell-free DNA is the most sensitive and earliest detector of recurrence. And the circulating tumor cells tell you more or are useful for telling you about the biology of disease and potentially why cells spread to other parts of the body, because obviously if they sp spread through the bloodstream and you can um, pick up and capture those um, tumor cells um, as they are spreading, it can tell you, for example, um, how aggressively the tumors will metastasize. But I think as a biomarker at the moment, cell-free DNA is the most powerful and the circulating tumor cells, in my opinion, are more a matter of research and tumor biology than they are for use in clinical care. I think it's a very, yeah, very exciting space um, that definitely needs to be followed. I think there's been um, some success also, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there has been some, some quite a lot looking at um, the application of liquid biopsy also in nasopharyngeal uh, carcinoma um, and its successes there. And hopefully, um, yeah, we'll continue to see uh, continue to see similar trends as we've seen with other tumors with, with wider uh, application of liquid biopsy. Um, so just a final question, just to wrap this up. So this has um, come from um, Aphrodite Every, Every Pidu from um, Cyprus. Um, I just wanted to ask for any suggestions for a patient with um, pharyngodermal fistula after laryngectomy and radiotherapy. It's really uncomfortable for him to keep cleaning um, the saliva all the time. Is there any device we could use to collect the saliva until doctors finish, finish all the examinations and organize possible repair um, fistula operation? Try to put something like a urostomy bag, but the position of the fistula doesn't help. Any suggestions would be appreciated. So I presume this is a open question um, for whoever feels, okay, Arthur, go for it. <laughs> so I just had this happen. <laughs> I had it in a patient I did a laryngectomy on um, who, uh, I actually took back and reconstructed again, um, but he's just really, you know, as we'd like to say, uh, poor protoplasm. He had a really low albumin. And uh, so I wanted to buy some time to see, you know, before we did, went back into his neck, we used a vacuum dressing. We have a uh, wound um, nurse who uses this vacuum dressing that, you know, hooked, actually hooks to a machine. And it went right over the area of the fistula, which was sort of on the side. Um, not only did it work to keep it clean, the fistula closed. Uh, so he is now, he's actually in the hospital because we pulled his G-tube out and his G-tube fistula hasn't closed yet, but uh, he is eating a regular diet at this point. Um, the vacuum drain was on for three weeks and it was maintained. Not an easy place to keep it on the neck, obviously, but we put lots of tape and uh, the wound nurse took care of it every day. So, um, and I spoke to other head and neck surgeons who have used it as well, which is how we sort of came up with the idea. I don't know what Ian's thoughts are on that, but we've had good successes with multiple wounds, um, you know, but in the head and neck that worked great for a fistula. Yeah, I think vacuum dressings show promise, don't they? It, it depends where exactly the fistula is, because if it's right in the middle, then it's almost impossible to, to do anything. It's very difficult. You end up with a cuff tube in, and some something, I, I don't know, we, we don't, we, I'm glad to say we haven't got massive experience of it. When I worked in New York, the guys there used to pack them with bleach, you know, put, pack them with ribbon gauze and bleach. And that's what the, le the chief there thought was the most effective way of doing it. And that was my job for a year to pack various people's necks with bleach soaked cotton. Um, not, you know, my finest hour, but um, 
it's a very difficult problem. You can get a variety of different kind of stoma bags, which can be cut to shape if you don't have access to vacuum dressings, um, but otherwise you're just trying to obliterate it. You can also get fistula devices, which are similar to the tracheosophageal uh, valves in some ways that, that, that patients may have, that you can put in and they have a flange on both sides. They're normally done under general anesthesia and then you screw them together. And the idea is it's supposed to rest the fistula and allow it to heal. I don't know there's any evidence they actually work, but they can, be, they can be used, very rarely used in our practice, I have to say. It's a very difficult problem. I'm sorry to hear that. And reconstruction is likely to be the ultimate solution here, as Arthur said. Well, thank you for, for your input. Hopefully um, that will help um, Aphrodite, who is from Cyprus once again, where I think the weather is probably far better. Um, at least it's better than it is here in Switzerland. And uh, knowing the UK, it's probably better than uh, better than in the UK. Sun is well. shining in Edinburgh, as always. Oh, okay. yeah? like you can see I'm basking in it here. <laughs> rare event, rare event. Um, excellent. So I think um, that will conclude the, the Q&A session. I know Chris has a video that he would like to share. Um, I would like to once again just uh, thank everyone for their, submit, uh, for their submissions, but also for the excellent research and pres presentations, which um, really, as I said, I think show the importance and also the great work that is going on in the field, um, especially even despite everything that's going on at the, uh, at the moment in the world, there's still um, great work that's going on and people pulling together. Um, so once again, thank you, um, Chris and Sharon, for inviting me to chair the session. I thoroughly enjoyed communicating with you all to um, pick the winners for the awards. Congratulations also to all the award winners, uh, and thank you for tuning in. Um, so on behalf of uh, Frontiers in Oncology, I hope to continue to see some of your work um, and hopefully see some of it in the journal as well. Uh, and with that, I will pass it over to Chris. Um, and yeah, thank you once again. Okay, thank you very much, Dominic. Um, I have one question to the three winners that we've got on here. It's very inspirational to see, obviously, winners of such young age. And, that, and that's what me and Dominic really wanted to do, was to highlight some of our young people coming through for research. So I've got one question I'm going to put to all three of you. You've got the world now listening. We've just had a question from Cyprus. We've got Australia. We've got... Uh, Japan, we've got from all over the world watching this conference. So if you had one wish, and I'm going to ask each one of you to give your wish to the world, what do you need and what would you like to continue your research and your research career? So I'll start with Lucy because she's been very quiet and very patient. She's got a lovely smile because I've seen her been smiling all the throughout. So, Lucy, you've got the floor. You've got the first wish. So you've got 30 seconds to tell the world what your wish is. Go off mute, Lucy. Uh, really difficult to say. I suppose for studies um, that require longitudinal monitoring, um, the, obviously the coronavirus pandemic has really halted things. And so if there was a low contact way of obtaining, you know, patient samples, reducing the risk of um, patient contact through frequent hospital attendances, I think that would um, give us a lot more data um, that we can work with. Because as um, Professor Aitman said, um, you know, a lot of these clinical research has been halted at the moment and that's, that's becoming a, a bit of a barrier for um, studies that do require monitoring. Perfect. So I'm going to go to, where are you, John? So you've got 30 seconds. Tell the world what your wish is. I wish we could collaborate with more people because everything we've been able to do has been because we've worked with great people who know what they're talking about. And the more people we can work with, the better. So when you talk about more people you need to work with, I'm interested in that. Give me some definitions of the people you'd like to work with and who are and what categories are there? So it's great to work with other scientists who have expertise in lots of different fields because it adds um, power to our research and to their research and it works for both of us. So it'd be great to reach out to people with different models, different ideas and different expertise within our fields and produce more stuff together. Perfect. You've got Mary on, and I think Joe might still be here. She is. 
and you've got Gillian. Three fantastic ladies in that field. If you don't connect and collaborate with those three, then the award's not worth giving to you. Because, um, <laughs> seriously, they can open so many doors that you guys need opening. Absolutely. Uh, I'll be harassing people with emails afterwards. Yeah, Don't you worry, Chris. Definitely. And I hope you three ladies pick up on these three young people also to give them guidance and help. And there's another lady that was on the panel called Jo Patterson. You need to connect with her as well. So I'm sure that Dominic can pass you all their contact details that are on the board. Um, and I wouldn't forget us patients and caregivers. You know, whatever you're modeling, whatever you're designing, whatever you're researching is for tomorrow's patient. We're living, we're, we're there. So if you need help from patients, don't forget us. So the winner, Ruthie, you still only get 30 seconds. Yeah, no, I was just saying I was Facebook, uh, not Facebook, but LinkedIn and Twitter stalking everyone on this panel just now. <laughs> so if you see it, invite, it'll be there. So um, you've got 30 seconds. Tell us what yeah, you're sure. like. I think I think Leroy Hood talked about it really well. So he he talked about the power of N of one and and really looking at the individual patient and getting their tumor tissue you know sequenced spatially sequenced, run the spatial transcriptomics on that, run the liquid biopsy over that, where you have the complement of the tissue, the the tissue data, the liquid biopsy data, the metadata, and I think treating patients using that N of one approach is really powerful and tailoring, tailoring therapies um, to those you know, individual patients would be really powerful. And I think we are moving in that direction, but I think more sort of integrated um, approaches would be really beneficial. And I think liquid biopsies have a real promise in, in, in that serial sampling um, over, over the course of therapy. So that integrated tissue and liquid biopsy aspect would be really powerful. Fantastic. We've got three great people, Arthur, Ian and Tim, how do you see your roles trying to incorporate these three lovely young researchers? I'll start with Tim. Put you on the spot, Tim. Come off me, I got come off mute. That's it. I think having I think having young researchers, clinical trainees and young scientists is the lifeblood of what we do. And, uh, you know, if the three prize winners or any of the poster um, submitters um, want to work in liquid biopsy, we would be delighted to do so. Um, I think that um, for head and neck cancer, particularly, we already feel that it's going to have a major impact. And we've got um, a new clinical trainee who's going to be starting doing some research with us at critical mass and joining up particularly with some of the other clinical studies that we've heard about in this session will be fantastically valuable and will accelerate progress in the field. Perfect. Arthur. So I have several thoughts. Uh, the research here is outstanding. One is that I, I would certainly love to collaborate with people because even though I haven't done bench research in probably 20 or 30 years when I was doing scanning EM um, and transmission EM, one of the things that uh, I've realized is I think having a clinician meet with the scientists is really helpful. There's a few areas I think we could focus on, and this helps quality of life beginning diagnostically. So liquid biopsy, you know, ways to figure things out uh, early on and less invasively. Secondly, um, I think uh, tailored medicine. So, you know, as we start to look at genetic testing and looking at the behaviors of these tumors, we can decide who's going to get, you know, certain treatments and who's not. If you don't need as much radiation, you can potentially have fewer side effects. The last thing is um, I would love to be able to figure out margins intraoperatively in real time, meaning that, you know, if, if, if we could, if I'm operating on a tongue cancer, going beyond just feeling it, which is often how we end up doing this and looking at the scans and being able to stain tissue or to, you know, shine some sort of light on it, um, like the photodynamic therapy we were trying to do back in the 90s. And to say, oh, wait a minute, these cancer cells go an extra five millimeters, let's go further around that, or we don't have to go around as far, kind of what the most surgeons do with uh, skin cancer. So those are my thoughts. Perfect. Um, you know, you can, when you hear these three young researchers, you can hear the passion and the drive in their voice. And I think that's what we need to capture. And I'd love to see one of these three or all three ending up coming out to visit you, Arthur, out there in your hospital, because I tell you what, 
you guys would be so inspired going to see Arthur in his workplace. And I know the collaboration will continue to drive. So, um, Ian, what's your thoughts on the three? Um, well, obviously, the a bit disappointed with the Edinburgh girl, but um, as for the other, other two, I thought it was excellent work. There's a, the, the importance of engaging people at training level in research is there's multiple factors. Some of them will go on to become researchers and that you know, very few will reach the heights of the professors that we have here. But increasingly understanding the science and understanding how to read a paper, how to uh, appraise evidence, and then how to apply it in the best possible way to your patient group is critical. So the majority of patient, oh, sorry, the majority of uh, trainees who are engage in research do not end up as academics. They will end up like Arthur and myself, probably, practicing clinicians, trying to do the best in, with what is a sea of evidence kind of pouring over you the whole time. And it's very difficult to appreciate what's more valuable, what's less valuable, what you should believe and what you shouldn't. And so although there is the drive to try and turn these people into academics, and that's a great thing, and we want to promote that through the universities and NHS and the, the clinical units around the world, in, uh, fostering a kind of understanding of research and its importance that it plays in uh, head and neck cancer and oncology management and medicine in general uh, is, is really the main aim of trying to engage young trainees in uh, having a research interest. And so we thank Frontiers for allowing us to do that for the first time in this meeting. That's great. Um, and uh, I enjoy the work that Frontiers do and contribute as a peer reviewer for you guys. So long may that continue. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, and has already passed. Go on, Mary, go. Um, yeah, I just wanted to really say that, I mean, fantastic work, of these young researchers. And I'd just like to encourage you to also work with the nurses and the speech therapists and the dietitians um, who are caring for people with head and neck cancer. I mean, we don't have, our professions don't have the same tradition of developing as clinical academics as doctors do. And yet, actually, we have a huge amount to contribute to research, particularly in the survivorship field. Um, so just wanted to add that. So could I suggest all our professionals in the chat, put your email and contact details so these three people can get hold of you, um, which would be fantastic. And what I'm going to do now before I close is um, I just want to show you the three nominees for the um, Health Awards. They've done a, a little bit of a mini film and you'll see why we chose these three. So I'm hoping that our mission controller there is going to now play a little bit of a film so we can all watch. Might take a couple of seconds. Hi, my name is Sean Amico. I live in Washington state. I was diagnosed with head and neck cancer in early 2019 and was fortunate enough to be enrolled in a clinical study focused on reducing the side effects of the, for the treatment of my type of cancer, including but not limited to oral mucositis and difficulties in swallowing and eating after radiation treatments. I'd like to thank you for considering my cancer care team for your award as they explore ways to improve the standard of care for head and neck cancer and reduce its side effects. Okay, I have my dogs out here waiting to go for a walk out on this beautiful fall day. I hope you have a good one. Bye, thank you. Hello, I'm Maureen Jensen from Head and Neck Cancer Supports Aotearoa. We're a New Zealand charity. We nominated the Auckland Northland Multidisciplinary Team, which meets every week in Auckland City Hospital. This is the hub hospital for our regional hub and spoke model. They have worked very hard, very hard over the last few years to include the patient voice in their planning. Thanks to our board members, Shane and Tony, for their interesting stories about two of the outstanding team members from this hospital group. 
Aroha Nui from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Hi everyone, I'm Brandy Page. I'm an assistant professor of radiation oncology at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. And I wanna tell you why I'm nominating our team for the Head and Neck Cancer Team Award. I um, want to share with you that at our program, we um, strive to treat as many patients that we can in the areas that they need. Um, we have a multidisciplinary team of clinical trials and countless number of team members that really are important to that patient's well-being. In addition to the teamwork of working with medical oncology, surgery, uh, radiation oncology, we have specialized speech and language pathologists who are just wonderful and social workers and dietitians and lymphedema therapists and physical and occupational therapists and nurses that all are trained in head and neck cancer that help that patient get past this situation and onto their lives. We're located in different sites within the uh, Baltimore and Washington areas in the US um, and we have lots of team members. Um, thank you very much. So that was just a little bit of a short film just showing you the three high nominations and I have to say we had quite a few from the UK and around the world. It was very hard to pick our three nomination winners so I just thought I'd share that with you. I think this morning has been a great session. Um, I've really enjoyed the Q&A session. I get, I get very excited when I see young people coming through into the world of head and neck because I know that there are game changers of tomorrow. You know, and when you when you get people like obviously Gillian and Elaine and, and Joe and Mary, you know, and the Tims of this world and Arthur's and Dominic, it's really nice to see our next generation coming through. And I just look forward to following your careers throughout and seeing what great work you all do. Um, I'm going to hand over now to our wonderful president, Mr. Ian Nixon, um, who looks like Scotland's suddenly gone dark, but um, he's obviously got the sun in his eyes and he's not used to that in Scotland. So I'm going <laughs> to hand over to Ian to close the session. Okay, well, listen, a great session today about the research or some aspects of research relating to head and neck cancer. I hope that the the audience have enjoyed what they've heard today and a brief kind of insight into the exciting changes that are happening on the research on the front the research front uh, as it relates to head and neck cancer in the UK and abroad. Um, thanks to all the speakers, thanks to all the presenters who uh, submitted work, thanks to Dominic for chairing this QA and for Frontiers for helping organize this. Of course, thanks goes out to Chris and Sharon, as we say in every single session. So I hope you've enjoyed this morning and we've got half an hour or 40 minutes or so until we meet back to start the afternoon session.